My name is Kenneth Harrell, and I'm a professor of history at um, Tulane University in New Orleans, where I teach uh, Greek, Roman, Byzantine, and Crusader history. And I'm going to lead you through a set of 36 lectures, which will deal with the origins, impact, uh, course of the Crusades, which ran from 1095 to 1291. Uh, it's a subject of interest to many uh, students of history. Uh, it's been subject to all sorts of romantic interpretations. And what I would like to do in this uh, initial lecture is to discuss uh, what do we mean by the Crusades and the period of the Crusades or the era of the Crusades. Um, I then wish to address some of the um, popular perceptions and even misperceptions of what the Crusades are all about. And then in the third part of this lecture, I want to set the stage uh, for our lectures uh, to come by sketching out the three civilizations uh, which were involved in these ventures, and that is the medieval Islamic world, uh, the world of the Eastern Roman Empire or the Byzantine Empire, that is the successor uh, to the old Roman Empire in the eastern lands of the uh, former Roman world, and also Western Christendom, or what we would call today Western Europe, but Christendom is actually a better term. By the time we end with this course, we may begin to start speaking of Europe or Western Europe as we understand it. So um, uh, let me start first with uh, what, what are the Crusades all about. Um, there are eight canonical Crusades that are often taught in textbooks, and uh, let's just uh, stop for a moment and think about what those Crusades are. Uh, they are the First Crusade, which uh, launched this whole venture and took Jerusalem in 1099. It was preached in 1095. It um, was first and most successful of Crusades. There was a Second Crusade led by two great kings of Europe uh, from 1146 to 1148. Uh, another great royal crusade with Richard Lionhearted, who's well known to everyone. That's in 1189, uh, uh, 1192. And it, it, it turned out to be something of a disappointment because it didn't retake the city of Jerusalem, which had fallen. The Fourth Crusade, we'll find out, is a pivotal crusade. It's a crusade that was to help Jerusalem, but ended up taking Constantinople. And that crusade acts as a pivotal point. And then the last um, uh, four crusades in the canonical eight were led, or were supposed to be led, by two great royal crusaders, Frederick II, that would be the Fifth and Sixth Crusades, and St. Louis of France. Now, the reason why these eight are given numbers uh, and there are some other crusades mentioned. There's the so-called People's Crusade, the Crusade of 1101, which I affectionately call Crusade 1.5. Um, is that they were, their, their size. They, these were great expeditions launched by either the nobility or the monarchies of Europe, uh, involving in some cases as much as 100,000 people, not all soldiers, but many of them pilgrims, who moved east uh, with the avowed aim of taking Jerusalem. And that's an important point to stress, that crusades, both in their size and their objective, is, is probably what gets them that number, that they were intended to take back the holy places, uh, the birthplace of Christianity, which most Christians saw as, uh, as literally the center of the world. Uh, the lesser crusades, the ones that didn't get numbers, like the Crusade of 1101, which just missed it, and some of the, the others that we'll encounter, uh, these were more in the tradition of armed pilgrimages, uh, that is, the travel out to see Jerusalem without necessarily having the same dimensions of a full crusade. And I think that difference in size and also objective is, is, is very important, and clearly was understood even at the time that there were certain great crusades and then there were lesser ventures. Uh, furthermore, it's another point I wish to stress that the period of the Crusades closes uh, when Jerusalem is no longer the objective. And the use of the term crusade as a general term for religious war is really an extension of the term that comes out of the Fourth Crusade and this thing known as the Albigensian Crusade, a crusade preached against heretics in southern France in the 13th century. And, and that leads us into a very uh, different direction. And as, and as uh, I would strictly define crusade in its medieval sense, uh, they really fall, fall, start to fall outside the bounds of the course. And after 1291, the crusading period is over. Well, what do we mean by all of these images of crusades? How have they been perceived? Uh, why is there a great interest, especially in popular opinion? It appears in novels, it appears in movies, uh, television shows, uh, uh, all sorts of legendary figures are associated with the crusades. Well, for one, um, this, there's a, a very widespread romantic perception that goes back to the Middle Ages. And many of the princes and knights of Western Europe assume the cross, that is, they pledge to go to Jerusalem, uh, 
and liberate the holy city, and they did so as a display of their honor and chivalry. And crusading activity over the course of the 12th and 13th century was very much uh, a display of the nobility and chivalry expected of the military caste of Western Europe. It was really uh, very much a family tradition. Many of the families that went out to, on crusade in 1096, their, their descendants continued to go on crusades. And there was a whole tradition of living up to the great ancestors, or in several instances, as in the case of the kings of France, uh, trying to erase the memories of a disgraceful uh, performance on an earlier crusade. Uh, Western Europeans came to uh, define their values far more sharply by going on crusades. And this is seen, for instance, in their reaction to perhaps the greatest of the Muslim uh, uh, commanders of the time, Saladin, the Sultan of Egypt, who was seen as almost a better example of chivalry than most of the Western Europeans on crusade. Uh, and uh, hailed as, in many ways, the supreme uh, example of a chivalrous man. And these notions feed very much into our romantic notions of the Middle Ages. Um, and the idea that the Templars, the Hospiters, these men who uh, fused a um, religious vocation, they were in effect a, a religious order, like a monastic order, but at the same time they were warriors, they were dedicated to the defense of the faith, the defense of the holy city. These emerged in the early uh, 12th century at Jerusalem. Um, they're looked upon as the epitome of chivalry. Uh, they again, of course, are figures that are quite common in novel and romance, uh, starting in the Middle Ages and running to uh, the present day. And so a good deal of these romantic images come very much out of the epic, the chanson de geste, the troubadour poetry uh, created in the 12th and 13th centuries. And, uh, and they are still a powerful image. Uh, the term crusader very often is a flattering term. Not always. Sometimes it's erotic. Sometimes it's derogatory. But someone going on a crusade is supposedly doing this uh, uh, action for some kind of noble reasons. On the other hand, uh, in more recent uh, generations, there's been a, a darker side stressed of the Crusades and reinterpretations of what this historical movement meant. Uh, the dramatic uh, uh, expansion of national states of Western Europe, uh, especially in the late 18th, 19th, and 20th centuries, um, led to a real reinterpretation of the Crusader movement. Now, some of these were very positive and others are not so positive, and these, these images are still very powerful today. Uh, in the 19th century, the French, above all, since many of the earliest crusaders were Franks or French, the French uh, spent a great deal of interest uh, on the crusades. Some of the finest works in early crusader scholarship are written, written by French scholars. Um, they stress the idea of the crusades as the first step in uh, nationalism, in the, in the sense of um, uh, imperial nationalism with the great missions in, in Africa and East Asia. The Crusades were the start of, of France's mission in the holy places, claims to the area of the Ottoman Empire, its colonial mission in Algeria. Uh, Germans picked up on these themes. Uh, German intellectuals and politicians, encouraged by Bismarck, uh, cast the great crusader King Frederick Barbarossa as uh, the first great national king of Germany. Uh, that the Third Crusade, actually Frederick was also on the Second Crusade, but the Third Crusade was, was the great national German effort that Frederick unfortunately died an untimely and really unseemly death. He, he drowned in a not so important river in Turkey, uh, and that someday he would come back and reawaken the German nation. He becomes almost an Arthurian figure in this German nationalism of the 19th century. Um, but there's another side at looking at these, these more modern images, and this, this becomes particularly common in perceptions and popular literature after the Second World War. Uh, the Crusades can be seen as the first of uh, a series of European imperial ventures into the Islamic and also the Greek Orthodox, the, uh, the Eastern Christian worlds. And these are not such friendly images. The Crusaders are cast as religious fanatics, uh, men uh, brandishing their swords in the name of religion, but really acting out of political motives, out of avarice. Um, they, um, and there is some evidence to support this, uh, some very good evidence. The sack of Jerusalem on the 15th of July in 1099 was a disgraceful act that shocked the Islamic world. The Crusaders burst into the city and butchered the Jewish and Muslim populations. There were ugly pogroms, and that's what they really were, the slaughter of Jewish residents in cities in the Rhineland by members of the people, People's Crusade. And one could multiply the examples of religious intolerance, um, the general failure of the Christians uh, coming from Western Europe to under, uh, understand Islam at all on its own terms, and, and the lack of Western European 
Christians, even after 200 years of residence in what is called Outremer, that is the Crusader state set up in the Levant, um, that is the lands across the sea in French, of, of any understanding of is Islamic theology, the Koran, uh, all the great achievements of Islam. So these are, these are images that are very powerful. It's led to criticisms not only in Western Europe, but they've been revived by Arab nationalists. Uh, today, one of the most derogatory terms you can throw at a Western European or a North American is a frangi, a Frank, a crusader. Most of the first crusaders were from uh, France. They were Franks. And this is still a derogatory term in the Islamic world. And so these images are extremely powerful, these, these negative images, and they balance this romantic tradition uh, going back to the Middle Ages as well as these 19th century nationalist interpretations. So uh, the Crusades are really a remarkable phenomenon coming out of the Middle Ages, still being debated, still being discussed today, uh, and still being seen as having an immediate influence on our world, uh, especially on the Middle East. Well, let's let's take some of these uh, assumptions and, 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 and explain and elucidate that they're not the whole story at all. Uh, they are um, uh, based in a certain amount of facts, but there's a couple of points we should remember before we venture on to these lectures. Religious warfare and fanaticism was by no means the monopoly of the Western Europeans in the 11th, 12th, 13th centuries. Far from it. Members of all three of those civilizations, the Islamic, the Byzantine world, and of course Western Christendom, all agreed that there was such a thing as religious war and it was to be waged under certain circumstances. Islam was a faith born with jihad, that is, holy war. There is an articulated ideology of holy war, the expansion of the uh, heartland of Islam, the war against the unbelievers. This is a notion that goes right back to Muhammad. It is still a premise in Islam. It's invoked uh, in various ways and fashions down to this day. Um, on the other hand, the Muslims did have, especially in the era before the Crusades, uh, a rather articulate and, um, and by the standards of the age, a tolerant uh, treatment and policy towards the non-believers, the many, the Christians, the Jews, Zoroastrians, uh, they were treated as second-class citizens, they were disarmed, but nonetheless, uh, they were not to be destroyed, they were not to be slain in some act of fanaticism, even though there might be disgraceful acts of destroying a city, this was not policy. Uh, and so the Muslims very early had to come to terms with the fact that uh, they ruled a majority of non-Muslim subjects. Um, Western Europeans, on the other hand, actually had to progress to the notion of crusade and holy war. It's not in the New Testament. You had to go back and fuse Roman notions of a just war. The Romans always assure us that they never waged an unjust war. And Roman texts, uh, certainly from the second century BC, the Romans actually have a special facial right in which they justify their wars, uh, usually combined with the claim that their envoys had been um, unceremoniously murdered by the um, offending power. Uh, and so that tradition fed in. It was known to St. Augustine, writing in the 5th century. Uh, it could be fused with Old T Testament visions of religious war, that is, the Israelites conquering uh, uh, Canaan uh, and, and throwing down the idols. Uh, and furthermore, there was a long tradition of converting pagans, heathens, in Central and Northern Europe by the sword. Charlemagne, the great emperor of the Carolingian state, is uh, reputed to have slain many Saxons who refused conversion on the banks of the Weser. Um, uh, there were forced conversions across uh, Central and Europe and in Scandinavia. Uh, these could be easily justified with the whole martial ethos that comes uh, out of the Celtic and Teutonic peoples of Western Europe. And so by 1095, there were a number of traditions feeding into religious warfare. Even the Byzantines themselves, the great heirs of the Roman tradition who styled themselves as the most, you know, in a sort of sanctimonious way by Western European standards, uh, styled themselves as the heirs of the classical tradition. They were the true Romans. Even they had notions of religious warfare. There is an incident that's often cited uh, that the Emperor Nicephorus Phocas in the 10th century, really, really a raspable fellow, one of my favorite emperors, that he, that he, um, uh, approached the then reigning patriarch, uh, Polyductus, and said, uh, give us remission of sins. That is, if you die in battle against the Muslims, imperial soldiers will go to heaven. And the patriarch answers, I can't do this because by the fact that you have blood on your hands, you've, 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 you've broken one of God's commandments. And, and, and this incident is often cited as an example, well, the Byzantines really didn't have religious warfare uh, the way the Western Europeans or even the Muslims, and that's not true. Uh, imperial armies, Byzantine imperial armies, repeatedly went into battle under religious symbols, 
Gospels. Uh, the most common depictions on the rock-cut churches of Cappadocia of the uh, 10th and 11th centuries in Central Asia Minor are the saints St. Saint Theodore and St. George, who on a number of occasions are claimed to have fought in the ranks of imperial armies, to have given victory. Uh, and there's a number of cases where the Byzantines fought under religious symbols, and these symbols were extremely powerful. And you have to remember, all armies went into battle under religious symbols, whether they be Muslim, whether they be Christian, whether they be Greek Orthodox. Uh, there would be sermons, there would be stirring speeches, appeals to the faith, uh, and that's extremely important. And it was accepted by all uh, the uh, great religions on, uh, of the Middle Ages, that war in defense of the faith was justifiable or to, justifiable or to expand the faith. So um, this is one preconception that should be removed, and I think it enables us to look at how the traditions of uh, warfare uh, did differ in um, the Islamic, um, Western Christian, and Byzantine worlds, um, and that is a subject we'll get into later on, uh, dealing with the origins of crusading and armed pilgrimage. Well, with those images, that background, uh, I'd like to uh, conclude this uh, lecture with a discussion of the three civilizations under study. Uh, one of the reasons why the era of the Crusades is so important uh, is that it brings these three civilizations, three related civilizations, uh, the Islamic world, uh, Byzantium, and Western Christendom, together. Uh, that's not to say they were in complete isolation before the era of the Crusades, but the contact had been uh, considerably more limited. Uh, furthermore, in many ways, the era of the Crusades is the climax to a whole number of changes in institutions, uh, economic development, r religious uh, attitudes uh, in all three of these civilizations, which can be traced back um, to a common parent that is the late Roman world. Uh, all three civilizations had a common origin, uh, perhaps less so Islam because it had a secondary tradition in Iran and, and farther east, but all three of these civilizations in one way or another could style themselves as, uh, as the heirs to the great Roman cultural, political, and religious traditions of the fourth century, especially with that uh, great Christian Emperor Constantine. Well, let's look at the um, Islamic world first. Certainly by the standards of by whatever standards we wish to measure a civilization. In 1095, when Pope Urban II preached the First Crusade, the Islamic world was clearly to be regarded as perhaps the, as, as, as without doubt, the most successful civilization. The only other rival it had was uh, classical China, um, the so-called Sung Empire on the other end of the Eurasian landmass. Uh, and the Islamic world, um, was premised on a very important notion that political and uh, spiritual authority rested in a single person, the caliph, the successor of Muhammad. Muhammad was the final prophet of God. Uh, he had given God's final revelation, uh, and by the time of the Crusades, certainly by the time of the ninth century, uh, the Quran was regarded as the uncreated word of God. That is the direct revelation uh, by God through Muhammad absolutely no interpretation. What was recorded in the Quran were the words of God, and the caliph was the heir to this tradition. Uh, the caliph ruled over an ummah, a community of believers that embraced all Muslims, and Muslim is a term that means he who submits, or that is, who, who submits to the will of God, to the will of Allah, and Allah is simply the Arabic word from, for God. Uh, and that uh, all political and religious life uh, issued from the caliph and his agents, and so that the notion of a split between a spiritual and a secular world is really very artificial. And in this sense, um, uh, the Islamic world is very much in line with the vision of the Emperor Constantine, the first Christian emperor who uh, established the Christian Roman state and who saw himself uh, in this position of combining both secular and religious authority. Not to the degree of the caliph, but uh, he was often called as the equal of the apostles and, uh, and was put on par uh, with the ecclesiastical uh, authorities of the Roman world. And I always think that if Constantine had visited the Byzantine, Islamic, and Western European worlds on the eve of the Crusades, in some ways the Islamic world would be far more congenial to him than even, than even East Rome and Constantinople, where his capital was uh, centuries later. On the other hand, the Muslims were divided on exactly who had claims to that religious authority. In 1095, we shall see that there were at least two, probably, well, if you want to bring in the, the Spanish caliph, which no one really expect, except the Spaniards cared about, uh, there, were, there are two choices of caliph. 
Um, uh, there was a division over this, uh, uh, of this issue of succession. One was the caliph in Baghdad, often known as a Sunni caliph, that is the orthodox, which what came to be the majority opinion in the Islamic world, and, and that authority claimed to have control over the whole Islamic world. The other choice was Cairo where there was a Fatimid caliph, a caliph that represented the Shiite and the Aliyid sectarians and offered a different vision of the Islamic world, a different vision of authority uh, with Ali as virtually a, uh, a figure on par with Muhammad. And there was a major civil war, in effect, raging between Cairo and Baghdad over which which regime will, will, would become the, the caliphate. And, the, and the, this played to the advantage of the Crusaders who arrived uh, in the Near East at a time where this war was going on and it divided uh, Islamic authority very bitterly. And in the course of the Crusades, that, that, that issue is going to be resolved. Uh, eventually, it is not going to be the Fatimid Caliphate or the other sectarian caliphates. It's going to be uh, the Abbasid and ultimately the descendants of the Abbasid Caliphate that will triumph. Also, the Islamic world uh, being extremely successful in many ways, it should be remembered that it was politically fragmented that whatever the caliph said, whether in Cairo and Baghdad, there were numerous political orders uh, that were really outside of his control, that most of the Islamic world was divided up into the hands of different dynasts who protested their, their loyalty to a caliph, but really essentially ruled their regimes on their own. And they ruled over states which to a large extent were still a majority of non-Muslims. Christians, Jews, uh, in Eastern Islam, Buddhists, Zoroastrians clearly formed the majority. And again, this would change as a result of the Crusades. We can spend less time on the Byzantine world, the uh, Eastern Roman Empire, because that empire was a great bureaucratic state. I've lectured on it before, and it really was very much the successor to the late Roman state I just described. Um, the Byzantine emperors ruled from Constantinople, uh, and in Constantinople, uh, the same notion that spiritual and secular uh, authority were closely associated, or not maybe the same person, but the patriarch of the Orthodox Church and the Orthodox Emperor of Constantinople resided in the same capital. And contrary to many popular opinions, it wasn't that the patriarch was the chaplain of the emperor, far from it. Patriarch and emperor were seen as two figures who cooperated when they disagreed. That was seen as a schism, as a cutting that was very disquieting to most Orthodox believers. The norm was cooperation. The secular and spiritual worlds were essentially part of the same, and religious identity was the key way of, dis of identifying oneself in the Byzantine Empire. Were you Orthodox? Did you give your loyalty to the Orthodox Church and Empire? It also was up until just before the Crusades, a generation before the Crusades, the greatest military and political state in Christendom. It did suffer a crushing defeat at the Battle of Manzikark in 1071, and actually the Crusades are... are um, ignited uh, by an appeal of the Emperor Alexis I for military aid uh, from Western Europeans to take back uh, historic lands lost to the Seljuk Turkish invaders, these Muslims who occupied Asia Minor. And then that brings us to our third civilization, Western Europe. I like to always put it that Western Europe went on crusade in the world of the Romanesque cathedral and emerged uh, out of the crusades in the High Gothic. Uh, that perhaps is a simplification, but in, in many ways, Western European society and civilization uh, underwent the most traumatic changes as a result of the two, genera uh, the two centuries of crusading. Um, and Western Europe also highlights the fact that in dealing with the Crusades, and this will become quite evident in the coming lectures, this is not simply going to be a set of lectures on Crusades 1 through 8. Uh, the Crusades were far more than just those eight military expeditions. Uh, that the, uh, the impact of the Crusades, its influence on political institutions, on economic change, on religious life, on the very identity of Western Europeans far transcended just those expeditions. And a good deal of what we're going to be looking at is analyzing uh, the repercussions and impact of those Crusades with Western Europe as our main focus, and then also trying to give as much uh, attention that we can for the Islamic and Byzantine worlds that were also uh, very much influenced by these ventures. Uh, but as to Western Europe at the start of the Crusades, clearly it was not on the same level as the other two civilizations. Uh, whereas the Islamic world and the Byzantine Empire presented the images of very powerful civilizations, both of them with some kind of bureaucratic state, with a, a powerful 
ruler who could get his will done, who could collect taxes, and both states uh, with the notion that uh, political and uh, spiritual authority essentially rested in the same place in a great capital city, Baghdad or Cairo in the Islamic world, Constantinople in uh, the Byzantine world. Uh, that was not what obtained in Western Europe. Uh, in 1095, there was a great religious capital in Europe. That was Rome. Rome had emerged as the religious center of Western Europe. Uh, part of that was through a historical accident that the popes in Rome claimed to be the true successors of Peter. They were the only patrine see, that is, apostolic see, that could trace its descent back uh, to an unbroken succession of bishops all the way to Peter. Uh, and they were the only see in Western Europe that had that claim. The others were in what is, uh, in 1095, either the Byzantine Empire or the Islamic world. Uh, furthermore, Roman had been the capital of the Roman Empire, especially the Western Roman Empire that had collapsed in 476. So the popes also inherited all of the uh, legitimacy and respect, uh, the mantle of the late Roman emperors. And so in the papacy in Rome uh, were the religious authority of the Western Church, as well as all those Roman imperial traditions. However, political authority, that is secular authority, was not uh, in Rome. In Western Europe, the majority of kingdoms, and really the, the main power were the principalities and the, the feudal states of Western Europe, the majority of these states uh, were founded by Germanic, in some cases Celtic rulers, who while they gave their allegiance to the Pope in Rome as their spiritual father, uh, essentially governed regional churches and uh, regional states. And even in their own kingdoms, their power was, uh, was very, very much restricted by custom, and real power was at the regional and local level among the great feudal lords in the, um, uh, in the states that came out of the Carol Carolingian Empire or in other types of uh, strong, uh, powerful figures, um, old Celtic chiefdoms and the Celtic fringe, um, local rulers in Anglo-Saxon England. So Western Europe presented a very, very different picture. Here, spiritual and political authority were not one and the same. There was this peculiar division. And on the eve of the Crusades, this, this issue is being battled out. Um, exactly what is the relationship between Western, in Western Europe between the papacy uh, and the various political figures of Western Europe? What was the relationship of spiritual and secular on the abstract level? Which was superior? Uh, the popes always claimed that, of course, the spiritual was, and they were in charge of it. Uh, monarchs in Western Europe tended to disagree. Uh, this leads to a series of uh, debates, disputes, the so-called investiture controversy, and to some extent, the Crusades are connected with this debate. Uh, they don't solve the debate, far from it. They actually widen the arena in which this debate will be played out. Uh, and it also is a debate uh, that leads to peculiar developments in Western Europe, to a division of these two authorities and the emergence of the, of the Western European nation-state order, which is quite distinct from the older traditions closer to the Roman world that you see in the Orthodox Empire, Orthodox Empire Byzantium and the Islamic world. And I always put it this way, at the start of the Crusades, I think most of the Muslims and Byzantines were really quite perplexed. You know, who was ever in charge of these expeditions? They would be preached by the Pope, nobles might show up, kings might show up. It was a very, very peculiar venture. Uh, to the Byzantines and Muslims, and it reflected the unusual nature of European society, which had evolved along different lines and had diverged from its Roman uh, uh, traditions in some ways far more than either the other two civilizations. And that's a point that's important to stress because it's often overlooked. The Western Europeans had built their civilization on a set of local institutions and premises uh, that were not necessarily Roman. They were Germanic, they were Celtic, uh, in some cases uh, pre-Roman. So, uh, with those three civilizations, what we plan to do is to, d uh, to address this course in really three parts. We're going to look at the whole origins of the crusading movement in the first 12 lectures. We are then going to move to the first century of the Crusades, and for convenience I call that the 12th century. Uh, that is from the capture of Jerusalem in 1099 to the collapse of the kingdom at the Battle of Hatton, uh, July 1187. Uh, about Oh, I would say two-thirds of those lectures are going to be dealing with the political and historical narrative. And then we're going to spend four lectures on cultural exchange, uh, economic impact, uh, and a number of other uh, thematic issues that came out of the 12th century. And then finally, in the last third of this class, we're going to deal with the last century of crusading. And, that, and those set of lectures, likewise, will combine both narrative as well as economic and cultural change. 
You will note that throughout this course, uh, there will be a real effort to address not only what went on in Western Europe, but also what went on in the Byzantine world and in the Muslim world. And it is necessary to see all three perspectives because all three civilizations uh, were at play. Uh, there's constant influence among the three. And the consequences, while maybe different for each civilization, were nonetheless profound. And all three civilizations came through this experience greatly transformed. So with that introduction, um, and uh, we shall now turn to the first um, uh, part of this class, which is why did the Crusades emerge in Western Europe? What led to this peculiar version of uh, uh, religious warfare that had as its objective the capture of the holy city of Jerusalem, which for all Europeans in 1095 was literally the center of the world? In this lecture, I wish to sketch the Byzantine world in the time of the Emperor Basil II, who ruled from 976 to 1025, often known as uh, Basil the Bulgar Slayer, Bulgar Octonos uh, in Greek. And the reason for the choice of that reign is that uh, he represents the epitome of what is known as the Middle Byzantine State. In the year 1000, as I mentioned earlier, Constantinople was clearly the greatest Christian state uh, bar none. And in his reign, uh, many of the institutional, religious, and cultural features of the Byzantine world are, are articulated, and this is the world in which the Crusaders will come into contact. Uh, and I think Basel's reign is a good way of showing how the Byzantine world looked when the Crusaders arrived in 1095. And he's living approximately a generation and a half earlier than the Crusades. He ruled from the city of Constantinople, founded by the Emperor Constantine back in the 4th century AD, which was hailed the New Rome. And through much of uh, Byzantine literature, uh, Constantinople is often referred to as the New Rome. And by the time of the Crusades, for a variety of reasons, the Byzantines were very, very finicky about insisting that they were the New Rome and that the Old Rome was really quite inferior. Uh, the city was also hailed as the Queen of Cities. Both Byzantine and Western writers uh, both uh, uh, speak of the city that way. Now, Basil II, as all Byzantine emperors, ruled over a powerful bureaucratic state. Uh, this state had adopted the use of the Greek language in the 7th century as its administrative language. The emperors were often known as a Basileos, a king in ancient Greek. Uh, many of the Roman Latin terms had been translated in Greek or had been replaced uh, by Greek terms. And the empire was largely Greek-speaking. Its core was what is now uh, Asia Minor, Turkey, uh, the Aegean Islands, Greece, uh, the Lower Balkans. But the Byzantines also controlled extremely important possessions in southern Italy and had claims in Basil's time to Sicily as well, which was still a majority of Greek speakers. However, Basel's empire uh, had influences that radiated far beyond the uh, political frontiers. Uh, the Byzantine missionaries had been successful in converting the South Slavic uh, peoples as well as the Russians. And uh, starting in uh, 989, uh, the Prince of Kiev, Vladimir, embraced the Orthodox faith uh, and was married to the sister of Basel II. So the Byzantine state is often referred to as a Byzantine commonwealth uh, in the time of Basel II, uh, was more than just its immediate political area. Furthermore, this Byzantine emperor uh, was the heir to political and ideological traditions that go all the way back uh, into the late Roman period and even earlier. Byzantine emperors insisted uh, that they were uh, equal to the apostles, iso apostolicus in Greek. Uh, they often uh, also maintained they were the new David. And they had a mixture of images coming out of the Old Testament uh, and out of uh, Greek uh, religious uh, themes uh, from the late Roman period, in which the emperor was seen essentially as a partner to the patriarch, that is, the spiritual head of the Orthodox Church. Patriarch and emperor were often seen as working in tandem. They resided in the same capital, that made it all the more easy, and there are occasions where patriarchs and emperors clashed. And in those circumstances, the Byzantines themselves saw that not so much as a uh, struggle between church and state as a schism, a cutting within the single Orthodox community, which hits that theme I mentioned earlier uh, in previous lectures that uh, the Byzantine world did see a coincidence of spiritual and political authority, that there was a single Orthodox community administered by a Byzantine emperor as well as an Orthodox patriarch. 
Uh, emperors also uh, elaborated their uh, uh, great uh, uh, ceremonial role. Uh, in the course of the two centuries before Basel II, uh, you got the impression that a Byzantine emperor never held a normal conversation. At least that's what state occasions seem to indicate. Uh, the emperor was glorified and dignified. Uh, there is a elaborate set of um, instruments that were created in the imperial throne room, uh, including a mechanical bird tree uh, powered by uh, uh, steam. Uh, there was also something of a barber chair, which was devised by the emperor uh, of Theophilus, where the emperor would receive uh, barbarians' um, uh, um, envoys, and he would be seated. Uh, the barbarian envoy would bow down and present his position, uh, petition. The emperor would press a button. Uh, the seat went to the second level. There was a quick costume change, and then the emperor was sent down. And when the barbarian looked up, uh, the emperor, who had previously been in emeralds, was now in rubies. And they were just amazed. How could the emperor do this? Now, now some of these devices seem rather simple to us, uh, but they were impressive uh, to the peoples of the time. Um, Byzantium uh, also uh, had uh, the Roman architectural traditions, its churches, notably Hagia Sophia, and all of these were employed as diplomatic uh, emblems and weapons uh, for the Byzantine emperor. There was nothing more impressive than to be taken into a uh, full mass in Hagia Sophia. Uh, there are reports of certain Russians, uh, especially uh, Queen Olga, converting simply by the fact that uh, God must dwell in this, this magnificent church. So uh, the, uh, the Byzantine emperors really did cloak themselves in orthodox symbols. And uh, one point that I should stress, and this is especially relevant to the time of the Crusades, by the time the Crusades arrived, the classic uh, Byzantine religious art, and I draw that distinction from private art, had triumphed. Uh, the images that we associate with Byzantine art uh, were now the norm. Uh, Basil II, who was uh, one of the great Macedonian emperors, this was the dynasty that ruled from 867 to 1056, uh, a dynasty that uh, sought legitimacy by upholding the veneration of images, icons, uh, and also donating enormous amount of imperial money uh, to churches, uh, to monasteries, to schools, and really making orthodoxy, the orthodox tradition we associate with the Eastern Church today, uh, the religion of the dynasty and the religion of victory, as we'll see in another lecture. So uh, that's an important point uh, uh, to stress, that when the Crusaders arrived, they found a remarkably rich uh, Christian architectural and religious tradition. In addition, uh, Basel II, as all Byzantine emperors, uh, commanded a really impressive professional bureaucracy and army. And this is a point I need to stress, because when the Crusaders arrive, uh, they're coming out of a very different uh, political and administrative situation. They are dealing uh, with a situation where power has been localized, uh, the so-called feudal system we'll discuss, uh, whereas the Byzantine Empire retained the professional institutions of Rome. And that is an, uh, a point I can't stress enough. This gave the emperor the power to tax his subjects. This gave the emperor the power to build a bureaucracy to administer his empire far more effectively than any Western European state. And some could even argue even far more effectively than the much larger Islamic empire. All that is a question under debate, but the Byzantine emperor could really get his revenues out of his subjects and impose his will probably more effectively uh, than most monarchs uh, in the Middle Ages. Uh, Greek, as I mentioned, uh, was now the administrative language. The uh, uh, court was organized around the elaborate ceremony uh, with uh, numerous salaried officials. Uh, a whole hierarchy of special uh, uh, attendants on the emperor. Uh, eunuchs were often uh, designated as holding positions important. Eunuchs were preferred because they did not represent a threat. They had been mutilated. Uh, they acted as a shield to the emperor, so while the emperor might uh, uh, feed a discredited eunuch minister to the crowd, he himself was personally protected uh, because they were often people of low origin or slaves who had been purchased from outside the empire. Uh, and this is a tradition that also went back to late Rome. Uh, all of these traditions struck the Western Europeans as very curious. And Anna Comena, uh, of whom I will speak quite frequently in this uh, course, uh, the Byzantine princess who wrote uh, in the first half of the 12th century and gives us some of, us, uh, our, uh, some of our most accurate uh, descriptions of the Crusaders, uh, constantly uh, drops little hints and points along the way on how the Crusaders misunderstood uh, the protocol, the ceremony, how they very often seem to react both with envy as well as some sort of self, um, 
uncertainty uh, in dealing with the Byzantine court. In addition to the Byzantine bureaucracy, there was also a very impressive army. Although, uh, after Basel's death, that army uh, declined quite rapidly. Uh, the Byzantine emperors, again, because they had access to their subjects, to the taxation, to a bureaucratic class, could maintain a professional army. Uh, this army has been subject to a great deal of uh, debate in recent years, and uh, not the least of it, in part, fueled by Western European perceptions during the Crusades. And I'll uh, read a passage of uh, Western Europeans' attitude of the Byzantine uh, army uh, later uh, in this course. Uh, but put quite simply, the emperor had in effect two forces. He had a field army stationed in the city of Constantinople, uh, often known as the schools, the scoliae. Uh, these were late Roman regiments going back in some instances to the 4th and 5th century AD. The Byzantine army had a tradition uh, stretching all the ba back to the Roman period. In many instances, these units could um, uh, point to their origins under the Emperor Constantine or some other uh, emperor. And this was extremely important. They had a sense of unit integrity, a sense of professionalism. Uh, they were subject to corruption, purchase of, of command and all the like, as any military on occasion. In Basel's case, uh, these forces were drilled to a ruthless uh, level of uh, professionalism. Uh, also, there were important elite bodyguards, uh, foreigners who were taken into the imperial service and part of that field army. The most notable for Basel were the Varingians. These are the uh, Scandinavians of Russia, uh, the uh, uh, mostly Swedes who had settled in Russia and came down the rivers of Russia, entered into imperial service, and reputedly Basel had 6,000 of these fellows. Uh, they fought in battle with the double axe. Uh, they were invincible infantry, and it is uh, this uh, infantry tradition that we'll see in Western Europe uh, coming out of the Germanic tradition of fighting with axe and spear uh, that Basel uh, deployed. Uh, besides the field forces in uh, Constantinople, there were also what we would call provincial armies, the so-called themes, and these were armies that were um, quartered in different districts of the Byzantine world. Uh, Asia Minor was carved up into a series of new administrative districts in the 7th and 8th centuries, and the armies, in effect, were dispersed into the countryside. Soldiers were given land in return for imperial service. Uh, they uh, showed up at regular intervals to be drilled. And one might think, well, how is this different from the medieval Western s system of giving out a fief? Well, the difference is that in the Byzantine system, central authority was always there. The soldiers were given land. Very often they were land owners. They were given land to be worked, uh, especially if they were cavalry. Uh, they were, in effect, a, uh, an aristocratic elite. Uh, and they were under imperial officers. They were, pe they were paid by the imperial government. So that the emperor never surrendered his power to not only to tax his subjects, but to tap into the military service of his soldiers. There were no intervening local levels here. That is, imperial officers commanded. They were responsible to the emperor. They could be removed from the emperor. To be sure, many of these officers were generally great magnates in their own right, but ultimately they were tied to Constantinople, the life of Constantinople, and so the army was controlled and kept under the hands of uh, the emperor. Uh, Basel II, who is responsible for some extremely impressive uh, imperial gains, uh, especially in the Balkans and Italy, and his immediate predecessors for gains against the Arabs in the east, uh, developed a third component of uh, field armies on the frontier. Uh, there was one in Italy stationed at Bari, uh, the Italian city of Bari today, uh, another one at Antioch in northern Syria, uh, one of the key objectives of the First Crusade, and then another one on the upper Euphrates. So that the Byzantine army at the time of Basel's death in 1025 was without question one of the most impressive military institutions around, and certainly by Western European standards, extremely impressive. There were a role for mercenaries. Byzantine emperors always hired mercenaries. Uh, often mercenaries were then given land and assimilated into the regular Byzantine uh, military structure. So a number of Western Europeans, starting in 1000 and uh, going on to the, through the whole period of the Crusades, actually served in these Byzantine armies and gained a great deal of important military technology. At the same time, now that, that's the sketch of what Basel's empire looked administratively, militarily. At the same time, Constantinople was also the New Jerusalem. And this is an important point to stress, and it also raises some of the problems that Byzantines and Crusaders had with each other. By the time of Basel's death in 1025, most Byzantines found the notion of recapturing Jerusalem, well, rather strange. 
to the Byzantine world, and this is a position that prelates and theologians at law art articulated, the new religious center of the Christian world was in the new Rome, Constantinople. Uh, many of the most important relics had been translated to Constantinople. Uh, notable of them, uh, the most notable of them is the icon known as the Hodogetria, uh, the depiction of the Virgin Mary and Child, in which um, uh, she's uh, depicted in a very distinct form, and it reputedly was painted by St. Luke. Uh, we know in 626 that this icon was paraded around the walls of Constantinople to ward off an attacking force of Avars. Uh, and thereafter, uh, Constantinople always saw herself as uh, the Mary protected, the God protected city. Uh, late Byzantine coins of the 13th century actually depict Mary over uh, the city of Constantinople uh, as the protectress. Uh, St. John, St. Luke, uh, relics of them are, were also translated. Numerous saints, ascetics, uh, and other figures going back to early Christian hi uh, history ended up in Constantinople. And there was a constant outpouring of imperial money uh, to rewrite the landscape of Constantinople into a new Christian city. Basel II, uh, who wasn't quite as interested in, in church building, uh, however, was uh, the son uh, and grandson of emperors who had been quite active in promoting that kind of construction. Uh, what went along with this notion that Constantinople was the new Jer Jerusalem was also something of the Byzantine world of the un uh, view of the universe. Uh, Starting in the 6th century AD, there were efforts to reconcile uh, classical geography with Christian theology. Now that might sound like a stretch, but given the fascination with numbers, and especially when you remember Greek numbers are letters, so you know letters have values as numbers as well as magical values, you could see how some of this would come about. Uh, the most favorite of these, to, for, me anyone, uh, for me anyway, is a fellow by the name of Cosmos Indicoplustes, uh, who wrote a topography, a Christian topography, in which he reordered the world as a rectangle. It, well, he also had the earth in the, the center of the universe, uh, and earlier Greek uh, classical opinion was divided on whether it's heliocentric or geocentric. So he had the, uh, the Earth in the center of the universe, and the Earth was essentially in the form of a rectangle with Constantinople in the middle. Uh, and some of the notions of geography are really pretty chuckle-headed. Uh, nonetheless, uh, these types of notions of what the world looked like, that geographically Constantinople was the omphalus, that is the center of the world, the navel of the world, a term taken from the early Delphic Oracle, uh, were pretty widespread. And that's seen in, all, in both Byzantine imperial ceremonial as well as in um, uh, Byzantine uh, diplomatic arrangements. Uh, for instance, the seating of clergy uh, from the whole of the Orthodox East was carefully regulated. How close was the bishopric to Constantinople? Uh, envoys coming to the emperor were seated based on their religion, that is, Orthodox princes closer to the emperor, Western pr princes more distant. So they had a very, very powerful hierarchical sense of the world. And again, as I mentioned earlier, Anna Komena captures some of this with the gruff uh, Western European knights of the First Crusade who come in and really are quite taken aback by this type of protocol. Uh, they're used to shaking hands. Uh, there's even one instance of an oafish uh, Norman knight uh, sitting in the emperor's throne because uh, he got board, uh, and the Emperor Alexis uh, just ignored him and eventually went away. Uh, but the, um, the hierarchy of the court uh, was a way of focusing power. The Byzantine emperor could deal with envoys, with religious figures, through these traditions, impress, awe, and uh, that was part of the secret of Byzantine success. Uh, membership, as I mentioned, in the Orthodox faith was all important. In uh, the time of Basel II, uh, the Orthodox faith had been clearly defined. The Byzantines had gone through a veritable religious civil war called the Iconoclastic Controversy uh, from 726 to 843. Perhaps one of the most important uh, religious issues discussed in Christianity between the great councils of the 4th and 5th century and the Reformation. Uh, these uh, disputes, uh, the, there were a series of controversies in iconoclasm. These disputes led to the definition of the role of images. Uh, it led to the defining of the Orthodox liturgy. It influenced the construction of churches. Uh, most uh, churches uh, were built for private worship. Um, these would be the cross and square design. Uh, the icons, uh, both fresco and mosaic, 
uh, were carefully articulated so that no matter where you stood in the church, uh, the uh, story was very clear to you. There would be the Pantocrator above. Uh, you might see an Anastasis scene. There would be the doctors of the church, that is the great theologians who defined orthodoxy with the resurrection scene above it. Uh, but all of this was worked out in the aftermath of the iconoclastic controversy and really promoted uh, by ba Basil's forefathers and Basil himself. So when the Crusaders came to Constantinople, they encountered this full orthodox uh, tradition. And uh, in that tradition were some unusual aspects of, of the Byzantine Orthodox Church that probably uh, puzzled Crusaders. Uh, first, the Patriarch had enormous power. He had more central power and authority over his church than the contemporary Pope in Western Europe. And that is a point that is often missed by those who study medieval history. It's usually assumed that the Middle Ages was an age of faith, the Pope dominated Western Europe. We'll see that isn't quite uh, the way it was. There are certainly papal claims to authority, uh, but in many ways, the Patriarch in Constantinople was far more effective. Uh, and this might strike you as odd for a moment, because often it's thought, well, you know, if the Patriarch and the Emperor are in the same city, obviously the Emperor is the more important, and the Patriarch is just the chaplain of the Emperor. Far from it. For one, the Patriarch presided over a central imperial church. Appointments to the great monasteries, to the uh, bishoprics, all went through him. Now, he might consult with the Emperor, and there are, are times when the Emperor would uh, interfere with papal elections or the uh, patriarchal elections or the consecration of a bishop. But on the whole, there was only so much the emperor could do on that. And very often they would be in agreement on these issues of who would be appointed. This also meant that the bishops, archbishops, the great abbots of the Byzantine world, spent a good deal of their time in Constantinople, angling for advantages, uh, angling for translation, that is a move to a more lucrative sea. Um, you didn't want to be uh, a bishop of um, Caesarea. If you could be bishop of Ephesus, you'd get closer to Constantinople. There's that kind of intriguing going on, uh, intrigue going on. Uh, 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 and in addition, the, the uh, 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 patriarch had at his, disposable, at his disposal a number of powerful monasteries in the city of Constantinople, including the monastery of St. Theodore of the Studion, and if the emperor ever really gave him any trouble over religious matters, he could simply put the word out and 10,000 monks would take to the street, rioting. And believe me, the patriarch, when he wished, could start a riot very easily. That's done in 1054. Uh, in the period of the Great Schism, the issue of the Great Schism, uh, the Patriarch simply orchestrates a riot to discredit the Western Europeans. Now, um, the um, Patriarch also, as well as the Emperor, felt that they had some kind of spiritual authority for the wider Orthodox world. If the Byzantine Empire was more than just its political boundaries, so was the spiritual world of Byzantine Orthodoxy. Uh, the Patriarch of Jerusalem, the Patriarch of Alexandria in Egypt, the Patriarch of Antioch in Syria, which for most of the period was under Muslim rule, the last, and only recently put back under Byzantine rule, all three of those patriarchates were seen as symbolically linked to Constantinople. The various Eastern Orthodox populations, as well as Monophysites, Nestorians, all sorts of other uh, Christian confessions living under Muslim rule, were seen as somehow under the spiritual authority and protection of the Emperor in Constantinople and under the spiritual guidance of the Patriarch in Constantinople. This is seen very often in the iconography. Uh, even in such a later church as the Church of the Savior in Korah, if you look at all the saints, they're the saints that come from the whole Orthodox world. Saints from Persia, from Egypt, from Dalmatia, uh, today Yugoslavia, well beyond the frontiers of the Byzantine Empire. And there was a sense of a wider Eastern Orthodox Commonwealth, uh, which was very real to the Byzantines. So the Byzantine Emperor was certainly concerned about Jerusalem. Uh, Byzantine emperors actually donated a great deal of money to the reconstruction of the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. Basel II was the first to do so in 1001. Uh, several of his successors uh, greatly extended the size of that church. But on the whole, um, they had no need to conquer and occupy Jerusalem because everyone knew Constantinople was the new Jerusalem. This gets me to uh, another important point. Well, if this is the case, if, if the patriarch held such a, a prominent role in Constantinople, what was his relationship to the pope? And this is an issue that's going to keep reoccurring uh, throughout the period of the Crusades. The Emperor, Alexis I, issued an appeal for military aid. And the primary person he went to in Western Europe was the Pope. And there's going to be reasons for that, not to all the kings of Europe. 
Well, popes and patriarchs had a dispute going back well into the late Roman period. And popes always insisted that they were the foremost patrine see. In the great councils of the 4th century, this was upheld at several occasions, at Constantinople in 381, at Chalcedon in 451. However, the patriarch in Constantinople argued that by being bishop of the new Rome, he was on equality with the pope. He was in Greek, autokephalia, that is, autonomous head. And there were other points of dispute between pope and patriarch. Uh, one would be what happens in the event of an issue of doctrine. How is it solved? Well, by the time of the 11th and 12th century, it was very clear in the West that the pope could speak on doctrine as the successor of Peter. But in the patriarch, uh, patriarch's world, this could only be solved by an ecumenical council, where bishops from the entire Christian world come, and based on the authority of early Christian writers, uh, would come to their decision. And this, this distinction, uh, this is often known as conciliarism, that is the council, concilium in Latin. Uh, this tradition actually is still in Western European tradition as, as, as late as the early 15th century. Uh, but it, it, it never has a chance to, uh, to make itself felt in the Western church. And so this led to constant misunderstandings. Uh, emperors actually helped confuse the matter. Uh, Byzantine emperors were usually in contact with Rome. It's a fairly easy uh, sail uh, to get from Constantinople to Rome during uh, sailing season. And very often the emperors would play the patriarch and, and pope off each other. Uh, there were a number of these instances when the emperor, for instance, wanted a fourth marriage. The emperor Leo VI, uh, the Orthodox Church only allowed three marriages. Uh, Leo had the misfortune that his wives kept dying on him. Uh, and he still needed an heir. Uh, the patriarch said, no, three strikes and you're out. Uh, Leo appeals to the pope uh, Sergius. Uh, Sergius says, no problem, we allow four. And then immediately there's a dispute and the patriarch and pope uh, get into an argument over the question of the dispensation. Uh, there were other issues that came, came up uh, from an early date. Uh, there was a dispute over the so-called filioque that had been inserted into the Nicene faith by the popes, that is, uh, uh, from the Son, uh, that is, the, the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Son. That was not in the original wording. It was added in the Western Church uh, to help with the Arian Visigoths. Uh, the patriarchs insisted you needed a council to do this. The Pope said, no, my approval was sufficient. And again, these disputes would appear uh, periodically. Uh, the most important of them will be the schism of 1054, the great schism, where patriarch and Pope will excommunicate each other. But um, the important point to stress is about the time of the Crusades, uh, the two Christian worlds had moved off in somewhat different directions. In its liturgy, in its arts, in its notion of religious authority, they did differ. There were tensions between patriarch and pope, culminating in the great schism of 1054. However, for the major majority of Christians, most of these issues were not very important. Uh, until the time of the Crusades, the contact between Western Europeans and Byzantines was relatively limited. Uh, it might be pilgrims coming through, it might be mercenaries, uh, it might be merchants. Uh, the Crusades will change this. The Crusades will bring large numbers of Western Europeans into the uh, uh, contact of the Byzantines, and then uh, Byzantine Christian and Crusaders will have a real sense of where they differ. Now, that'll take about 150 years for those changes and animosities and clashes uh, to, to result in the sack of 1204 and, and other such matters. Uh, finally, a few words I'd like to say is Constantinople also functioned as the New Athens. Uh, it saw a great uh, cultural revival in the 9th and 10th centuries of its classical traditions. Uh, Basil II's family was very much responsible for the copying down of the classics. Uh, this all started with the polymath Photius in the 9th century, uh, the editing of texts of Plato. As I mentioned, our best account of the people in the Crusades, maybe not the definitive history of the Crusades, but of the people is the Princess Anna Comenna who actually saw and met many of the participants and who wrote her history in the 1140s after she was eased out of power by her brother uh, and is also in the well-known Greek tradition of uh, historians write history uh, because they can't do politics. She's just like Thucydides. He was uh, the Athenian historian who was banished for military incompetence and goes out and writes a uh, military history of the Peloponnesian War, uh, typical of most historians. But uh, Anna's account uh, gives us real insight uh, to these personalities. Uh, and the result is that Byzantine society 
as heir to this tradition, this classical tradition. Its aesthetics, its mores, its texts. Uh, the upper classes were very literate, men and women both. Uh, they had a fine sense of their continuity from the classical past and really must have looked upon Western Europeans as quite crude and boorish. Western Europeans often return the compliment with thinking that the Byzantines were a feat, uh, uh, too polished for their own good, and this would contribute a great deal to misunderstanding uh, between the two uh, sets of Christians. And I can only close with a good idea, uh, one, one small example, perhaps trivial, of, of what these differences really meant. And the one that, that always uh, fascinates me is that the Empress Theophano in the 10th century, a Byzantine Empress, was married to the um, Holy Roman Emperor Otto uh, II, and, um, and she's the mother of the Holy Roman Emperor Otto III. And when she arrived in Goslar, in the German capital, uh, the Germans were absolutely excited with derision about her effeminate, polished ways. And two points in particular they made is that Theophano uh, ate her food with a fork and bathed once a day. And these are perhaps the types of differences that in time would be stressed between the literate Byzantine society and the Western Europeans that would lead to a lot of the misunderstanding of the Crusades. In this lecture I want to cover three main topics uh, dealing with Byzantine zenith in the time of Basil II, uh, whom I've mentioned in previous lectures. And Basil II is often regarded as the most successful emperor since Justinian in the 6th century AD. He's often credit, credited with ruling in splendid isolation. And I, the three topics I'd like to cover would be those policies of Basil II that were so important in imperial expansion, in forging certain institutions that allowed the Byzantine Empire to survive a catastrophic defeat which sparked the whole summoning of the Crusades. Uh, then the other two topics are a rather extended look at uh, Basel's relationships uh, with the Western Europeans on the one hand and his uh, interests in the wider Near East uh, with the Islamic empires and particularly the role he had to play in assisting the great expansion of the pilgrimage trade uh, in the uh, late 9th and 10th century and the severing of that trade by the Celtic Turks in the 1070s and the 1080s is going to be one of the immediate causes for the launching of the First Crusade. So we want to really look at these three main issues in Basel II. There are a lot of others to discuss but I think these will bear very clearly on uh, our, our course on the Crusades. Now Basel in effect created a second heartland. For centuries, the Byzantine Empire had drawn most of its recruits, its resources, its money from Anatolia, Asia Minor, today Turkey. Uh, the Balkan provinces, uh, including most of Greece, had been overrun by Slavic invaders uh, during the 7th and 8th centuries, and these regions were only under a limited control uh, by the Byzantine emperors. Uh, to some extent, uh, at the time of Basel's accession, uh, the Byzantines essentially controlled the southern shores of Greece, and really the Mediterranean zones, the islands, uh, the towns, and in some ways the relationship looks very similar to what existed in archaic Greece back in the 7th and 8th centuries BC. Well, Basel conquered Bulgaria, and by Bulgaria we mean a good deal of what is now Serbia, Bulgaria, Albania. Uh, it was a momentous undertaking. Uh, he uh, spent most of his reign uh, uh, suppressing uh, the Bulgarians in these complicated guerrilla wars, and it climaxed in a great victory in the Clydon Pass, where Basel got his nickname, Bulgar Slayer, because after uh, defeating the Bulgarians, he reputedly put out the eyes of all the Bulgarians captured, except I think one in 100 was left with one eye and sent them back as a gift to the Bul or Bulgar Tsar, or the Bulgarian Tsar Samuel, who instantly died of a heart attack. Uh, we're not sure if the numbers are correct, but Basel apparently mutilated a lot of Bulgarians and broke Bulgarian resistance. However, upon the conquest of Bulgaria, this, this, this was in 1014, by 1016, within two years of that victory, Bulgaria was firmly under imperial control. Uh, that victory uh, resulted in a number of important consequences. One is the Byzantines now recovered the Balkan regions, uh, very rich in mines, forests, uh, uh, brought all these Slavic peoples who had been uh, brought into the Orthodox Church, now under direct uh, Byzantine control. 
Imperial frontiers now marched side by side with the Kingdom of Hungary, and the Byzantines had access, uh, political access, uh, immediately with Western Europe. Hungary was a kingdom uh, associated with the Holy Roman Emperor and had gone uh, over to the Latin Church. Uh, second, uh, Basel proved to be an extremely able administrator, not only a great conqueror, he respected the local institutions of the Bulgars, the Serbians, the Albanians, all of these people brought under imperial control. Uh, their particular Slavic rite uh, was respected. Uh, taxes were t uh, collected in a traditional manner. Uh, many Bulgarians and Serbians of merit uh, gained positions at court. Uh, and furthermore, Basel handed out estates to many Byzantine nobles, uh, many of them uh, by origin from Asia Minor, and built up, in effect, a second imperial heartland in the Balkans. Uh, now, that was an important point, uh, because when the Byzantines lose Asia Minor after the Battle of Manzikert, in 1071 and the Seljuk Turks occupy the previous imperial heartland, the old heartland of Asia Minor, that Balkan heartland allowed the emperors to regenerate their political power and take on the Seljuk Turks uh, in the 11th and 12th century, of course, with the Crusaders as their allies. And that is to the credit of, of Basel. It was an impressive undertaking. Basel also consolidated other frontiers, particularly on the east in the upper Euphrates. Uh, anyone who's traveled to that part of the world, uh, especially the upper Euphrates, the great regions of Transcaucasia, uh, the distances uh, and uh, the physical uh, barriers, especially the great rivers, the mountains, the gorges, are just uh, daunting. Uh, Basel, imp uh, in, uh, Basel imposed control over these regions. Uh, he put down several uh, uh, crucial uh, challenges to his throne. Uh, by the great uh, eastern magnates. There were two revolts early in his reign by the eastern army to unseat him. He crushed his, these rebellions quite successfully and then reorganized the upper Euphrates frontier, uh, reorganized the frontier in northern uh, Syria. He also brought under imperial control uh, the vast regions of Armenia. At the time of Basel's accession, there was no united Armenia. In fact, parts of the historic Armenian lands were under now imperial control and had been for a generation. But Basel annexed a number of kingdoms, particularly the kingdom of Vasporikon uh, in 1018, which is centered around the Lake Van today, which is now in eastern Turkey. And uh, that was one of the key Armenian kingdoms. And after his death, his successors continued to bring these Armenian kingdoms under imperial control. Now, these regions were strategic. They were the main entrance uh, into Imperial Asia Minor, and the Armenians were uh, related Christian peoples. They had embraced Christianity, but they had remained largely under a separated church. And there's been a great deal of discussion whether Basel was judicious in doing this and whether his successors should have allowed these kingdoms to remain as a shield to Byzantine power rather than bringing them under uh, imperial control. What could be said from the imperial viewpoint, and certainly from Basil's viewpoint, the Armenian kings and, and competing princesses, princes uh, provided very little security. They often warred with each other. They were not above inviting Muslim allies in. And really what Basil had to do was impose order. Uh, now the consequences of that uh, were not immediately evident. Uh, again, Basel, uh, in his customary manner, uh, sought out many Armenians for service. Uh, there is a a report that 18,000 of them, uh, the nobles and knights of uh, King John, the last king of, of Vosporikon, actually took imperial lands, took imperial service, entered into the imperial aristocracy. There are many imperial families with Armenian names. But a number of these Armenians uh, did not embrace the Orthodox faith, in fact, far from it. Most of them identified themselves with their traditional Armenian faith, their, which is supposedly a monophysite confession, all that, that's disputable, uh, and really uh, resented uh, direct imperial control. And there were a number of reasons uh, besides just orthodoxy. Byzantine emperors taxed, they administered. Armenian society was based on a much looser structure uh, with regional warlords. Uh, the faith was distinct. They used their own Armenian alphabet, their own Armenian rite. And while Basel was able to accommodate these Armenians, in the generation after Basel, many of these Armenians became increasingly alienated uh, from the imperial government, and when the Crusades show up, they actually welcome the Crusades as possible allies uh, against the Byzantines. 
Furthermore, uh, Armenians migrated in large numbers in Basel's reign from the historic heartland, uh, from the regions of Transcaucasia, around Lake Van, uh, into what is now southeastern Turkey called Cilicia in the Taurus Mountains. And there was, a, uh, in effect, a colonization. And these are regions immediately north of Antioch, and these Cilician Armenians, as they're often called, will play an, an extremely important role uh, in the Crusades, because they are not only allied uh, with the Crusaders, uh, they also sometimes are uh, at odds with the Emperor in Constantinople. And again, this is a result of uh, Basel's policy to impose some sort of order on the eastern frontier. Finally, Basel... Uh, really was able to rule in splendid isolation, not only because of his remarkable military victories, and without a doubt, as much as court ceremonial in the Orthodox faith was important to emperors, uh, military victory was just important uh, for legitimacy. Uh, Basel uh, broke the power of the great landed magnates, uh, the whole dunotoi, as they're called in imperial legislation. Now again, Basel, in, as in many of his policies, could look back to emperors as early as 922, who legislated on behalf of holders of military tenures, as they're usually known, that is, soldiers uh, under the old arrangement of the themes who had received land in return for military service, as well as peasants. And the language is often quite uh, vague, exactly what peasants are meant. Uh, are these the absolute impoverished? Are they uh, a higher class of peasants? Uh, but in what, whatever their exact identity, uh, the great uh, military and economic transformation of the Byzantine Empire in the 10th and 11th centuries had caused social tensions. Uh, many of the peasant uh, properties were being bought out by large landowners. This would include imperial officials, uh, members of the high clergy, uh, also army officers. And it endangered uh, the recruiting and equipping of theme armies. It potentially endangered uh, the imperial government's uh, access to its tax base. And Basel climax, uh, Basel's reign is a climax to a series of laws to curtail the power of these landed magnates. Uh, much of this legislation came in the wake of those two great eastern revolts I had mentioned earlier. Uh, the revolt of Bardas Scelerus in 976-978, and then of Bardas Phocas in 986-989. These were both commanders of the Eastern Army. They were known as the Domestics of the East. And these rebellions, which were backed by uh, the Eastern Army, caused Basel to move in and break the power of the landlords. And there were a number of provisions in these. They're called novels or new laws um, by Basel uh, uh, to do so. One was to assign to the wealthy taxpayers uh, the uh, assessment, the obligation to pay tax on all vacant lands in the area. Uh, this used to be uh, an assessment that was pushed off onto the uh, weaker taxpayers as a way of ruining, so, ruining them so the landowners could take it over. Uh, there were rules on holding markets, on holding fairs. There was very strict enforcement of how land uh, uh, would uh, succeed. That is, military tenures could not go into the hands of great landowners. Uh, these were pretty elaborate legislation. There's also a couple of remarks that Basel uh, used terror to enforce the laws. Uh, in one instance, he was traveling in Asia Minor and found out uh, that a high official of state uh, was actually a peasant who had bought out all the properties of the surrounding uh, village, had turned himself into a minor lord over his fellow peasants, and Basel immediately demoted him back to his original rank. Uh, this is a sort of way of um, you know, emphasizing uh, that you could do this, and the fact that he was surrounded by all those Varingian guards, uh, those Scandinavian axemen, helped. By strict enforcement of these laws, Basel really did ensure the supremacy of not just the emperor, but Constantinople. Uh, the capital did maintain control over those provinces. And many of the landed magnates, uh, even though they may have suffered under some of these laws, or more likely were curtailed in the areas they could expand, the amount of properties they could buy, nonetheless found that if they wanted to have a success, they had to go to Constantinople, they had to be at court, they had to take positions, uh, and there's a constant exchange between the provinces and the capital. And the capital of uh, the empire really was the center of the empire. And this is a tribute to Basel. Ensure that Constantinople would remain uh, the great capital, and he had carved out that second heartland. And those are two very important consequences. As for land legislation, well, that didn't survive long after his death, but we'll deal with that in another lecture. Now, Basel, as I said, uh, was also important because of his relationships uh, with Western Europeans and also uh, with the Muslim powers. And I'd like to look at the Western European situation first. 
Uh, we will be spending some time on uh, discussing in more detail Western evolution, uh, the so-called Carolingian Empire of Charlemagne, uh, the first great synthesis of Roman and Germanic institutions into a Christian political order in the ninth century. Uh, but for our purposes right now, uh, Basel II looked at the Western Europeans uh, with rather uh, mixed feelings. In some sense, the Western Europeans were very useful allies. Basel succeeded to a long tradition of cooperating with popes, and various Western European princes in Italy, uh, particularly the Lombard princes of uh, Benevento, uh, Salerno, uh, in fighting uh, the Muslim uh, pirates uh, from North Africa and Sicily, uh, these were uh, very complicated alliances. They had been pursued since the late 9th century. Uh, there's even a case where the, the Empress Zoe Carbospina and uh, uh, the Pope put together a composite army uh, to defeat a major uh, Arabic force in southern Italy in 915. Uh, so, in some senses, the Western Europeans were useful allies. Uh, there were also the important Italian maritime republics. To be sure, they were not at the order they would be at the end of the Crusades, but nonetheless increasing in strength and, and importance. These included the cities of Gaeta, Naples, and Amalfi, all in southern Italy, the city of Pisa, and above all, the city of Venice. All of these cities were linked to Constantinople by trade links, especially uh, Venice. And Venice was, even now, in Basel's time, uh, well... I think it's best described as a Byzantine city-state. Uh, in many ways, Venice was of the empire without being in the empire. The Venetians were clearly seen as a related people uh, by the Byzantines, and the contacts with these um, maritime republics were very important. Uh, Venetians uh, uh, provided naval support in Basel's wars against the Bulgarians. Uh, they were engaged in uh, pilgrimage trade to the Levant, which we'll talk about. Uh, and uh, they also were already establishing um, what I would call factories, that is, uh, stations, in, in some of the port cities in the Aegean and in the imperial capital. They by no means had taken over the carrying trade as they would in the 12th and 13th century. The Byzantine imperial fleet was still preeminent, uh, but they were coming to play a very important role in the Mediterranean economy. Uh, Basel also uh, had, however... Uh, feelings that some of these Western Europeans were a little difficult to deal with and were prevent potential rivals and dangers. Uh, foremost were uh, some of those same Lombard princes with whom they ally allied against Arab powers in Sicily and in Sardinia and in Africa. Uh, these Lombard princes were no notorious for rebelling, for attacking imperial possessions in Italy, uh, for refusing to pay proper homage to the emperor. There's a long tradition of Byzantines and Lombards battle, battling over southern Italy. Uh, in addition, these Lombards could look north and find support uh, from the Holy Roman Emperor. The Holy Roman Emperor was, uh, by Basel's day, uh, also the king of Germany. In 962, uh, the Emperor Otto I, who was uh, the Saxon king of Germany, was crowned Emperor of the Romans. Uh, this uh, entitled him to lay claim to the traditions of Charlemagne going back to 800 A.D. And that act of coronation in 800 A.D., uh, the Pope Leo III, who performed this service, claimed that he had transferred Roman power from Constantinople to Aachen, the capital of, of uh, Charlemagne. And Otto I was the heir to this uh, uh, political tradition. And by entering Italy and claiming the imperial title, he also claimed to be heir of the entire of Italy. He claimed to be the true Roman emperor. And this meant uh, repeated clashes between the German emperor uh, and the Byzantine emperor in Italy. Um, Otto I, Otto II repeatedly backed rebels against uh, the Byzantines, uh, often Lombards, uh, they were also uh, notorious for exchanging various types of envoys. Uh, the most in, uh, uh, famous of them is a fellow by the name of uh, Ludprand of Cremona, uh, who in 967, nine, um, 969, uh, leaves the scathing report of his contempt uh, for Byzantine court ceremony, constantly insisting his emperor was the real Roman emperor. And this sort of added another kind of comp complication. You had a problem of Pope and Patriarch. You also had a problem of a Western Emperor and a Byzantine Emperor. Uh, the hope was to solve this by marrying the Emperor Otto II to Theophano, 
uh, the Byzantine princess, uh, a cousin of Basil II, that was performed in 971. Uh, another marriage alliance was uh, attempted in 1001. Basil II actually sent his niece Zoe to Venice so she could marry the then uh, German Emperor Otto III, who was himself half Greek because his mom was Theophano. And uh, there were efforts to at least keep the two courts on cordial terms and work out some kind of arrangement in southern Italy. Uh, unfortunately, these never really came to fruition. Uh, the problem is, ultimately, the two emperors were really at odds. They were competitors rather than potential allies in Italy. Uh, there were several efforts after Basel's death to back rebels, and this will uh, actually culminate in a strange way in the schism of 1054. However, Basel, as well as his Lombard prince rivals in southern Italy and uh, the German emperor, well, not so much the German emperor, but certainly the Lombards, uh, hired mercenaries in these clashes. And uh, starting in 1016, we have reports of Normans serving in Byzantine armies uh, in southern Italy. Uh, they're extremely important in putting down a rebellion in 1016. Uh, these Normans uh, hailed from northern France. They were descendants of Vikings who had settled in northern France, uh, had adopted Christianity in the French tongue, and proved to be the most indomitable warriors in Western Europe. Uh, both Basel and his rivals in southern Italy uh, brought Normans in as mercenaries, and ultimately these Normans were going to take over, carve out their own kingdom in southern Italy, conquer Sicily, and eventually take on Constantinople. Uh, the Normans will be in the forefront of the Crusades. Uh, the uh, Norman Prince Bohemond from southern Italy, as I said uh, once before, reputedly one of the best generals of the First Crusade, was also intimately familiar with Constantinople. And once you get Normans into southern Italy, it's just a short step to Greece. So Basel's policies in, in the West uh, were in many ways rather disappointing. He didn't have the men and money uh, to really, uh, really to reconquer Italy uh, or Sicily. He could impose his authority, his hegemony, by a series of alliances, attempted marriage arrangements with the Holy Roman Emperors of the West, but this structure collapsed uh, shortly after his death in 1025. Then there's the question of Basel and uh, the Eastern frontiers. And in some ways, uh, Basel was really rather unconcerned with expansion in the East. Uh, his ancestors uh, had primarily concentrated on the European possessions. However, the Macedonian dynasty, the emperors who ruled from 867 to 1056, of, of whom Basel is the, uh, is the most preeminent, uh, had a series of what are often known as regent emperors. That is, the Macedonian dynasty had had a succession of crises in which a powerful general had forced himself on the throne. As a co-ruler, he would not displace the legitimate emperor. This happened with Romanus Lecapenus, uh, later Nicephorus Phocas, and John Simiscase. And these emperors, coming from the great eastern families, had put their stress on advances in Armenia, advances in Syria, fighting the Muslim foe and had pushed imperial frontiers quite deep into the Middle East. And when Basel came to the throne in 976, in his own right, he had actually succeeded at the age of four in 963, and he was under two separate region emperors. Uh, one of the questions was, would Basel continue this expansion? Would he, would he, in effect, bring the imperial power back into the Middle East? His um, predecessor, the region emperor John, had penetrated so deep into Syria at one point uh, Christian delegations from Bethlehem and Jerusalem had, had appeared before the imperial army and petitioned for governors. And some have gone so far as to say that the Emperor John uh, was on the road to a crusade, on the road to taking Jerusalem back for Constantinople when Basel came to the throne and called a halt on this. Well, that's probably an overstatement uh, that the Byzantines saw this as a crusade. But Nonetheless, Basel consciously decided not to advance imperial frontiers uh, into the east because this would play to the power of the great eastern magnates. The great families that had staged those revolts, the families who were the objective of so much of his legislation, 
And uh, therefore, uh, his uh, frontiers were stabilized. He created field armies. He put in administrative apparatus. He brought the Armenians into the empire. And in fact, bringing the Armenians into the empire was almost a security device in some ways because they would have revolted uh, with the eastern magnates. So you might as well bring them into the empire. They're, they're less dangerous in your control rather than out of your control. On the other hand, that didn't mean that Basel was uninterested. Far from it. Basel was important uh, for two important uh, for two reasons. Uh, one, uh, the political arrangements in the East allowed Basel to negotiate with the Fatimid caliphs in Cairo. Uh, these were a Shiite sectarian Muslim government who had been based in Egypt since 969. They controlled the holy cities of Mecca and Medina. They had originated uh, about 60 years earlier uh, in North Africa as the descendants of Fatima, that is the only daughter of the prophet Muhammad, and claimed to be the legitimate caliphs of the Islamic world. They were opposed to the caliphs in Baghdad, the so-called Abbasid caliphs. The Fatimid caliphs controlled Palestine, by which we mean um, the region uh, today of Israel, the West Bank, uh, which is the Roman term for the region, and I use it in that, that context, in its ancient context, not in its modern context. Uh, they controlled this area of Palestine and uh, central Syria. Well, Basel in 1001 made an arrangement with the then reigning uh, caliph in Cairo, a man by the name of Al-Hakam, uh, to ensure the protection of Christian pilgrims to Jerusalem and to Bethlehem. He began to pour money uh, into the reconstruction of the churches there. He also gained the right to supervise the appointment of the uh, Patriarch of, Constant of uh, Jerusalem, uh, the clergy, hospitals were built, or hospices perhaps is a better term, that is places for uh, pilgrims to recover, to get food, to get lodging. Uh, and in a way, Basel allowed for the uh, burgeoning of the pilgrimage trade. And, he, and it wasn't just this uh, treaty he signed with al-Hakam. It was also the fact that Basel had now imposed imperial authority through the whole of the Balkans, through Asia Minor and northern Syria, so that most Western European pilgrims who couldn't afford the expensive sea journey could travel down the Danube, largely under imperial protection, across Asia Minor, cross the frontier near Antioch, enter the domains of the Fatimid Caliph, who was an ally of the emperor in Constantinople, and make their way to Jerusalem. Now, I have a separate lecture dealing with the whole tradition of pilgrimage in Western Europe. But in the late 10th and early 11th century, as a result of Basel's uh, successes, as a result of Basel's uh, treaty with the Caliph, the, the numbers of Western European uh, pilgrims uh, increased steadily. Large numbers of them traveled to the East to see the Holy Shrines, um, the Church of the Holy Sepulcher, um, uh, the, uh, the various uh, uh, pilgrimage uh, 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 tourist sites in Bethlehem. And when this uh, pilgrimage is cut off in the 1070s and 1080s, its impact in Europe is going to be immediate. It's going to be disrupted, uh, and it comes at a point where pilgrimage had been increasing for well over 50 years. In addition to that, Basel also uh, was responsible for promoting uh, an enormous amount of exchange among uh, the various churches of Eastern Christendom. Uh, Basel himself, uh, without any imperial ambitions to recover these areas, however, encouraged uh, the uh, movement of architects, uh, hymnologists, uh, prelates, uh, between uh, the Byzantine world and the Eastern Orthodox worlds that were under Muslim control. Uh, these resulted in some really remarkable exchange. For instance, uh, in 996, the um, uh, Dome of Hagia Sophia, which was built by Justinian, was uh, restored um, through the efforts of an Armenian architect, a man named Tiridates in Greek, uh, commissioned and brought in by Basel. So even though Armenians and Byzantines are supposed to be at odds at each other on religious or at least theological grounds, um, in terms of the more practical and daily matters of faith, uh, they were quite uh, a great deal in common. Uh, there's also um, the dissemination of, of objects, uh, relics, uh, traditions of martyrs, that spread across uh, the whole Eastern world. The most ex extraordinary example of this is in Ethiopia, uh, which remained a separate Christian kingdom, long cut off from the Byzantine world because the Muslims controlled Egypt and Arabia and Syria, and nonetheless, 
Uh, Ethiopia maintains this contact in its painting, in its use of Greek uh, as a liturgical language, uh, uh, well into the Middle Ages in Basel's reign uh, and beyond. So that um, uh, Basel's empire uh, was really the epitome of this orthodox uh, Byzantine commonwealth. Now these are extraordinary uh, achievements for uh, the Emperor Basil II. And as I stress, he's not alone in allowing this to happen. He's drawn upon precedence. He had predecessors who assisted. But when he died in 1025, most Christians clearly regarded him as the greatest warrior of his age. Most Christians also thought that Constantinople was an eternal imperial order. It was the historic Christian empire. Uh, Western Europeans had come in ever greater numbers, seeing the Queen of Cities, had seen the pilgrimage shrines in, uh, in Palestine, and there was almost a sense, well, there will always be a Constantinople. It is the historic kingdom. Whatever the tensions and difficulties between Pope and Patriarch, between Western Emperor and Byzantine Emperor, uh, there was this um, uh, image of Constantinople across Western Europe. It's best to, uh, expressed, for instance, in Norse sagas, where Constantinople is a fabulous land, where many uh, Norwegians and, uh, and Swedes went to take service, uh, gain privileges from the emperor, and then return to their homeland, uh, greatly enriched and trying to imitate uh, Byzantine arts. Uh, and uh, there's actually coin types from um, Scandinavia based on Byzantine coins. There's a variety of ways in which these uh, arts are uh, transmitted. Therefore, the rapid demise of the empire in just about a generation after Basel's death was stunning. Uh, he died in 1025. By 1071, the empire had suffered a catastrophic defeat, uh, and this eventually precipitated the First Crusade. And why this defeat occurred, um, why the Byzantine Empire was plunged into crisis, is the subject of another lecture. Uh, but it is extraordinary, probably to observers at the time, uh, that such a splendid heritage could be cast away so readily by his heirs. In this lecture, I wish to cover the uh, dramatic collapse of Byzantine power uh, in the second half of the 11th century. Uh, this is the failure of the heirs of the Emperor Basil II. And as I mentioned in a previous lecture, this uh, dramatic political collapse of the Byzantine state is the immediate uh, cause of the Crusades. And uh, the Emperor uh, Alexis I will summon Western European allies to assist him in the reconquest of Asia Minor from the Turkish invaders. Exactly how did this happen? Well, in this lecture, I'd like to deal with uh, three related themes. One would be, where did Basel's heirs fail? And there's so many ways that sometimes I, when I lecture to students, I spend most of my time talking about uh, the incompetence of uh, Byzantine emperors in the later 11th century. And our primary source on this is a fellow by the name of Michael Sellis, who is a courtier, a philosopher, uh, not known for his modest, modesty. He himself claims to have rediscovered Plato and actually was better than Plato. Uh, nonetheless, he is a very observant uh, writer. He knew many of these emperors personally. And while he's not above praising himself, he also gives us insights into what happened at the court and where Basel's heirs went wrong. The other two sections would deal with the new threats posed to the imperial government. Uh, one of them was in the West. This was the Normans. I brought them on the stage uh, not too long ago in a previous lecture where they were brought in as mercenaries and they emerged to challenge imperial power in Italy and eventually uh, invade Byzantine Greece with an eye to Constantinople. Uh, the other uh, invaders were the Seljuk Turks, or more accurately, the Turkmen. Uh, these were the nomadic pastoralists from Central Asia who swept through Iran, uh, regenerated the Abbasid, uh, uh, Abbasid Caliphate in 1055, and then uh, conquered Asia Minor as one of their many achievements in revitalizing the military power of Eastern Islam. So these are the three subjects that we have before us. Well, let's look at the first subject of internal problems. Uh, Basel, out of the fear of rivals, really in many ways uh, complicated the succession crisis. He never married himself. He, in fact, was very monkish in his habits. 
He avoided the company of women. In this regard, he was very much like his stepfather, uh, Nicephorus Phocas, although he didn't go the route that Nicephorus did of wearing a hair shirt underneath his armor all the time, which probably accounts why Nicephorus was so irascible. Uh, but nonetheless, he, he took a rather aloof and distant stance. Uh, he was a ferocious emperor, as I said, ruled in splendid isolation. And on the other hand, he never secured marriage alliances with his nieces and his sister uh, that would secure the succession. These never went through. Uh, there was an effort to marry his niece Zoe uh, to uh, the Emperor Otto III. That was cut short because Otto III died. Uh, and uh, the result is that when he died in 1025, he was succeeded by his co-emperor and elderly brother, uh, Constantine VIII, who was two years younger than Basel. And Constantine VIII had actually taken over the role of patron of the arts and uh, master of ceremonies while Basel was out conquering uh, Bulgaria and passing land legislation. Uh, Constantine VIII was also the father of Basel's three nieces, Zoe, uh, Theodora, and Eudoxia. Uh, Eudoxia was scarred by smallpox, so she was uh, bundled off to a, a nunnery. Uh, but the other two nieces could have been married uh, to a great uh, a member of the great uh, imperial uh, aristocracy or to an orthodox prince to secure some type of line of succession uh, so that that Zoe or Theod Theodora would be old enough to have children. Well, this was not done. And to some extent, this was Basel's fault because he feared rivals. By the time uh, those two nieces uh, came into power with their father, Constantine VIII, they were quite advanced in years and clearly beyond uh, years of childbearing. So from the start in 1025, it was clear that the Macedonian dynasty, which had ruled as perhaps the most successful dynasty in Byzantine history, was compromised. That somehow uh, this uh, dynasty would run out, it would have to rejuvenate itself by adoptions or marriage, uh, but from the start, those two nieces, uh, the elder Zoe, the younger Theodora, uh, were the keys to the succession. Constantine VIII himself was a man who was uh, probably quite learned, um, certainly quite feckless, and mistook uh, probably depravity for culture is the best way you could put it. Uh, he spent most of his time uh, carousing and enjoying himself, and even more than his brother, he was fearful of rivals, and therefore uh, made sure that no one of ability was appointed to position, uh, particularly military commands, uh, commands at court, uh, who could ever threaten him. He married Zoe, his older daughter, off to uh, a fellow by the name of Romanus III, uh, Romanus III at the time uh, was an elderly aristocrat, uh, clear that that couple was never going to have children. And furthermore, Romanus III had got as his wife a woman who was now in her late 40s, early 50s, uh, extremely fickle and extremely uh, spoiled. Uh, Zoe uh, needed and demanded attention. Uh, she indulged herself by frivolous spending and ex extravagance. And Romanus III was quite willing to indulge this because his position at, as emperor uh, was, was going to be uh, um, dependent on her. And in 1028, when Constantine VIII died, uh, Romanus took power uh, in his own right, but that right was based on his wife Zoe, the niece of Basil II. And I can't stress enough that Zoe and Theodora, from 1028 down to the death of Theodora in 1056, that in that period, those two nieces had inherited the mantle of Basel II. They were the nieces of the great Bulgar slayer. They therefore had the automatic loyalty of the court administration. They had the automatic loyalty of the Orthodox Church, of the, uh, the populace in Constantinople, and even elements of the army just by the fact that they were descended from the great Basel II and all of the emperors going back to the founder of that dynasty. The result was that Zoe became a plaything very quickly. Uh, Romanus III mounted one uh, military campaign. It was a disaster. He was nearly captured. Uh, he was actually saved by the intervention of the Virgin Mary and, um, and built a church uh, in her honor. Uh, he became bored with Zoe, uh, ignored her, uh, didn't so much carry out affairs, but just ignored her. He found her rather tedious. And as a result, uh, Zoe fell into the hands of the chief minister, a man by the name of uh, John uh, uh, the Many-Eyed, uh, and that's an allusion in Greek mythology to Argus, the Many-Eyed, uh, guardian of Zeus. Uh, John the Many-Eyed, who was the chief eunuch minister and controlled all the patronage at Constantinople. Uh, John indulged Zoe, uh, and for the next uh, 15 years would be the dominant power behind the throne. 
Uh, to this end, he introduced his younger, dashing brother, Michael, to Zoe. Uh, and Michael, who was um, uh, a handsome young man uh, in his late 20s, uh, was married to Zoe, I believe, in her 50s at this point, uh, once uh, Romanus III was conveniently murdered. Uh, Michael IV, uh, the new emperor, uh, who uh, came to the throne with Zoe as her second husband, uh, turned out to be just as weak in many ways as Romanus III. He had uh, youth and some kind of, uh, at least an effort to carry out uh, conscientious uh, military uh, operations and administration. But he was compromised for a number of reasons. He didn't understand court etiquette. Uh, he was an epileptic. Uh, there are reports from Michael Sellis, the court historian at the time, that whenever um, Michael uh, would go into an epileptic fit, uh, they would uh, bring a screen across the throne so that no one would see this undignified disease, which was really seen as a punishment from heaven uh, rather than some kind of illness that could be cured. Uh, he proved to be at least congenial to uh, Zoe. He did pay attention to her, but he was really in no position uh, to cut back on the uh, reckless uh, spending that went on to indulge Zoe and also uh, the cutbacks in the army. Again, that was part of the effort of um, Zoe and her husbands to secure their position. Don't uh, carry out expansion. Uh, don't pour money into the uh, uh, frontier armies because a powerful general might emerge and challenge you. Michael, to his credit, saw the succession difficulty. He arranged for the adoption of a nephew of his, uh, a fellow also called Michael, Michael V, and he was to succeed as the son of Michael and Zoe. And when Michael died in 1041, a horrible wasting disease apparently connected with the epilepsy, Michael V took power. Well, Michael V um, put Zoe in a nunnery, also um, ran out of court, the other sister, Theodora, brought in Slavic soldiers to impose order in the capital of Constantinople, and all of these were probably not a bad idea. He also dismissed John the Many-Eyed as a corrupt official. Uh, but uh, as I said earlier, all of that institutional support to the two sisters uh, played against Michael um, V. There was an uprising, a very carefully orchestrated uprising by the imperial aristocracy. Uh, Michael was captured, castrated, blinded, dumped in a monastery. That's the retirement package in the middle Byzantine uh, Empire. And uh, the two sisters were returned to power. Uh, it was clear that Zoe was completely incapable of ruling on her own, and they therefore selected uh, uh, husband number three, a man by the name of Constantine the Ninth Monomachus. Uh, Constantine the Ninth is uh, perhaps one of the most um, corrupt emperors ever to sit on the throne. Uh, he indulged Zoe, who died in 1050. Um, his sister-in-law, Theodora, he openly kept his mistress uh, in the courtroom. Uh, there's all sorts of stories by Michael Sellis about Constantine the Ninth. Uh, Michael Sellis does tell us that Constantine the Ninth's great virtue uh, was to recognize the brilliance of Michael Sellis, uh, and that alone should get him in the records of history, at least in Sellis's opinion. Uh, but Constantine the Ninth handed out uh, frivolous appointments, cut back on the military, and by his reign, the vast treasury that had been assembled by uh, Basil II had been spent out, and they begin debasing the currency. There's also all sorts of administrative and fiscal cutbacks. Uh, and with his reign, uh, the imperial dynasty is passing a watershed. Uh, there's no chance of any children. Uh, Constantine dies in 1055. Zoe, uh, Zoe had predeceased him. Theodora uh, rules very shortly on her own, the second sister, and she nominates uh, an emperor to follow him, uh, follow her as her son, a fellow by the name of Michael VI. But it's clear the dynasty is spent by 1057. The last connection to the imperial dynasty is gone. And now that opens up a number of problems because it's now open season to any aristocrat who can take power. Up until 1057, no one would move against the institutions of Constantinople. And here is an irony in that Basel was so successful in forging the institutions of the capital, in forging that uh, great power, that these frivolous nieces of his could hold power for so long after his death, for 30 years. Uh, and no one would move against him. Well, in addition to 
a failure of imperial leadership that was clearly on at the capital, you have to realize that in all of these medieval states that the personality of the ruler is quite important. Constantine VIII sent out the signal. No one of quality stayed at court. It was all corrupt. The only service that was at all uh, respectable was the army. And starting with Constantine VIII and particularly Constantine the IX, all officers of, of any kind of caliber were eventually removed. Uh, this is particularly true of a man named George Maniakis, who staged a revolt in 1043-1044. He had uh, uh, risen in the ranks under Basel II. He commanded veteran forces in the east. He had uh, served in Italy and eventually was driven into rebellion because of the corrupt and um, oppressive policies of the Emperor Constantine IX. He was unfortunately killed. Uh, by a stray arrow while besieging the city of Constantinople. And one thing about Constantine the Ninth, he was the most lucky of emperors. Always his rivals seemed to disappear. He had no control over events, but nonetheless, he lucked out on more occasions than once. Another important aspect is that the central government no longer took uh, Basel's policy seriously. Uh, taxation became heavier. Uh, the uh, Slavic and Armenian populations were alienated by the court uh, officials, central bureaucracy. The Slavic rite was suppressed in the Balkan provinces. The Greek rite was imposed. Uh, Greek prelates, that is, abbots and bishops, were appointed as uh, appointees from the capital. Um, steadily, the provincial populations who had been incorporated in the empire and had been won over by Basel uh, were being alienated. And this, the Byzantines would pay a high cost when the Crusaders show up uh, in 1095, 1096. Uh, finally, this... Uh, inept government opened itself up to two new foreign threats. And it's a real debate whether the Normans in southern Italy or the Seljuk Turks in Asia Minor were foes that would really have taxed the ability of Basel II. Uh, those of us who are admirers of Basel II would say that Basel would laugh at these foes and they would simply go away. Uh, but in truth, uh, the Normans and Seljuk Turks were quite successful because of the ineptitude uh, in the uh, central capital at Constantinople. The Normans, let's look at them first. As I had mentioned earlier, they had migrated from northern France to southern Italy first as Byzantine mercenaries. A number of them were actually on pilgrimage also to a shrine of St. Michael in southern Italy. And in the 1030s and 1040s, a fellow by the name of William the Strong Arm, uh, who was from Normandy, had a whole bunch of brothers and half-brothers, began to carve out fiefs for himself and summoned his brother, his younger brother, Robert Guiscard. And Robert Guiscard, who took over in 1046 as Count of Apulia, by which he means southern Italy, uh, over the next 40 years carved out a Norman principality in southern Italy. It would prove to be one of the most effective medieval kingdoms uh, in the entire medieval West. And he did this by playing off Lombard princes, Byzantine governors. He also was um, constantly attacking imperial, ter uh, sorry, papal territories in central Italy, that is the papal states, uh, sacking monasteries such as Monte Cassino. Uh, Robert Guiscard generally had running simultaneously two excommunications, one against him personally by the reigning pope, and the other as a general excommunication on all Normans uh, for attacking some sort of monastery. In Norman society, this was probably looked upon as a, a sign of one's uh, standing rather than any kind of uh, uh, moral statement. In any case, the, the Normans intended to take over the whole of central and southern Italy. And this drove uh, the papacy, uh, the Byzantine emperor, and even for a brief time the Holy Roman Emperor of the West into a rather strange alliance uh, to take out the Normans. And it uh, climaxed in 1053 when the then reigning pope, Leo IX, who was a great reformer pope, a man who really um, raised the position of the papacy, uh, sent a delegation of three legates, a fellow by the name of Cardinal Humbert, uh, a translator, uh, uh, Peter, the Archbishop of Amalfi, and a fellow by the name of Frederick of Lorraine, who was the Chancellor of the Pope, uh, handled uh, administration and finances. And these uh, three delegates were to negotiate a military alliance with the then reigning Byzantine Emperor, yours favorite, uh, Constantine IX, the third husband of Zoe, against the Normans. Unfortunately, everything went wrong from the start. 
The then reigning patriarch, Michael, decided to hijack and sideline this political mission into a test between Rome and Constantinople. Uh, the 10,000 monks of the Studian on call were sent into the streets. All sorts of stories were put out about uh, the filioque, uh, the difference in the liturgy, that the Western liturgy was being performed by the delegates in Constantinople. Uh, the emperor was absolutely powerless to do anything about it. He was uh, really behind the scenes. And Michael, in effect, provoked those envoys who were all men committed to the reform ideals where the papacy is the supreme authority in the West to issue a bull of excommunication. The irony is that these envoys had no right to do so. They delivered the bull of excommunication uh, on July 16, 1054, uh, a Saturday, on the altar of Hagia Sophia. Unbeknownst to them, their pope had died earlier and after he had been defeated by the Normans in a great battle uh, at Kivitate uh, and died in captivity in April, uh, that is a couple of months before. The news had not reached them. Uh, in return, uh, the patriarch of Constantinople issued his own excommunication. This is what we often call the Great Schism, the Great Cutting. Now, this was not based on doctrinal matters, but on matters of discipline. That is, the liturgy, the relationship of council versus the authority of the pope, um, uh, issues that aren't necessarily central to the Christian faith, but are very important to the administration of church matters. It was the climax of bad relations for the last 300 years between Constantinople and Rome. And I'd like to read an excerpt to give you some of the flavor of how this invective was tossed around uh, in the 11th century. And this is a selection coming out of the excommunication of um, Cardinal Humbert on the Patriarch Michael. Upon Michael, neophyte and false patriarch, brought only by mortal fear to assume the monkish habit, and now for his abominable crimes, notorious, upon Leo, so-called Bishop of Orchid, upon Constantine, Chancellor of the same Michael, who has publicly trampled the liturgy of the Latins beneath his feet, and upon all those who follow them in their aforesaid errors and presumptions, uh, except those who repent. Uh, let them be anathema, uh, as in upon the Simeonics, the Valasians, the Arians, the Donatists, the Nicolaitans, the Severans, the Panoictai, the Manichaeans, the Nazarenes, as upon all the heretics and finally the devil and all his angels. Amen, amen, amen. Uh, this excommunication was only lifted by Pope John uh, the 23rd in 1969. Uh, the Orthodox Church is still to respond. Most of these heretical groups named in here were long since disappeared, uh, and the vehemence with which these arguments were disputed uh, brings out an important point uh, of what's happening between the Orthodox and these Catholic churches. Theologically, they're essentially identical. They recite the same creed. But both churches, over the course of the Middle Ages, had involved independent liturgies, independent administrations, which began to assume, um, in effect, doctrinal importance. The Pope, successor of Peter, or do you use a council? The liturgy, do you, do you use the leaven or the unleavened bread? The Orthodox Church uses the leavened bread, that is little enzymes that make the bread rise, that represents the Holy Spirit. Uh, unleavened bread is to reproduce uh, the traditions of Israel in the Western Church. The sign of the cross, the insertion of the filioque. By 1054, these are beginning to assume cultural and religious significance and are part of that division, which will be widened as a result of the impact of the Crusades. Uh, the immediate result was no military alliance. Pope Leo IX had died. The Normans go on to conquer southern Italy. By 1071, they captured the last Byzantine fortress, Bari, have swept the Byzantines out of Italy, and in 10 years later, they actually invade Byzantine Greece. And the empire is fighting for its life against a new threat. Uh, at the same time as the, they were dealing, the Byzantine government was dealing with these Western opponents, the Normans, they also faced now a new threat from the East. And these are the Seljuk Turks. Uh, they unexpectedly appeared on the Byzantine frontiers in the 1050s. Uh, the Seljuk Turks, or more accurately the Turkmen, that would be the nomadic Turks, had been converted to Islam in the opening of the 11th century, uh, largely through contact with Muslim uh, merchants uh, coming from Iran and Baghdad, also from contact with military elites on the frontier. Uh, Turks were long prized as warriors uh, in the um, Islamic world. Many of them were recruited as slaves 
to staff the elite forces of the Abbasid Caliphate, for instance. And we'll discuss slave armies uh, in a later lecture. Uh, the Turkmen were heirs to the uh, traditions of the Ghazi, that is the nomadic warrior. Uh, they fought uh, uh, from horseback uh, with a composite bow. They were absolutely superb in skirmish and ambush, prized as uh, cavalry, uh, absolutely indomitable in, bar uh, in battle. Uh, they could draw opponents into ill-conceived attacks, ambush them. Uh, and the uh, Seljuk Turks, in the end, revitalized uh, the Abbasid Caliphate in the 11th century. Uh, the Sultan Tugrul Bey uh, from 1037 to 1063 united the Seljuk Turkmen tribes, swept through Iran, and in 1055 uh, entered Baghdad and restored the authority of the Caliph in Baghdad. Now his main interest, Tugrul Bey really thought that Cairo was his first and foremost objective. Cairo was the seat of the rival Caliphate. Cairo also controlled Mecca and Medina, the two holy cities of Islam. Therefore, uh, Seljuk armies were directed against the armies of Fatimid Egypt. As I mentioned earlier, Fatimid Egypt was in alliance with the Byzantine Empire. And no Turkish army could move against Syria, could move against Jerusalem and Egypt without taking care of its northern flank, that is the Byzantine Empire. At least that's how Malik, uh, that's how um, Tugrul Bey and his successor Alp Arslan saw it. Little did they know that the Byzantine Empire was not being administered by the best of rulers. In any case, there was a second uh, aspect of this. The Ghazi warriors had combined the tradition of nomadic raiding with jihad, holy war. And to keep these guys occupied, uh, very often these tribal armies or regiments were sent into Byzantine territory to raid because it would be annoying to the Arab uh, urban populations to keep, keep them stationed in the cities of Iraq and Iran, where Seljuk soldiers had a tendency to latch on to things and cause problems with the civil population. You know, any ruler wants to keep these fellows on the frontier occupied. So uh, Tugrul Bey released his Turkmen tribesmen, his, uh, these armies, onto the Byzantine Empire. And what they found is no serious resistance. With the death of the Empress Theodora, uh, power in Constantinople oscillated between a military elite and a civil bureaucratic elite. Uh, there were a succession of emperors, none of whom could keep control of the capital. Uh, the Turkish raids intensified. Uh, the uh, Eastern Army who put two candidates on the throne, um, a fellow by the name of Isaac in 1057-1059, and then a second one, a fellow by the name of Romanus IV, uh, um, uh, Diogenes, who's, who is from a, a great uh, military family, uh, were determined to take on the Turks and stop these raids. It was their estates that were being damaged. They were undermining uh, uh, imperial defenses uh, in Armenia and along the eastern frontier. So in 1068, the second military candidate is put on the throne. He has no real dynastic connections. He marries the previous, uh, the wife of the previous emperor, who himself was a bureaucrat, uh, Constantine Dukas. Uh, he knows he has to win a decisive victory to stop these raids. And he carries out a series of complicated campaigns in eastern Turkey. Uh, actually, really, it's Transcaucasia. It's the historic Armenian heartland. And these uh, campaigns climax uh, with a major campaign in 1071. Romanus recruited as large of an army as he could. And we have several different accounts on, on, on this battle and this campaign. And Romanus, by the time he came to the throne in 1068, faced some really serious problems. The fiscal crisis was really quite beyond belief. Imperial government's money was being debased at an ever rapid rate. The military system had apparently broken down. We're not quite sure what happened. But by the time Romanus launched his campaigns against the Turks, the old theme armies were no longer operating as the way we understood them. Nor were those field armies created by Basil II. A good deal of Romanus's army seemed to be mercenaries, including a large contingent of Normans, also Franks, and Pechenex, that is Turkish uh, horse archer warriors uh, from southern Russia. Uh, there were also contingents from the European provinces, Slavs, who were often appreciated for their military value. But the army that Romanus marched out to face the Turks was an army that had never fought together. It had no traditions of victory, no tr traditions of cooperation. It was assembled from various um, uh, contingents uh, quickly. Uh, it is an achievement that Romanus was able to put it together. Second, he faced a daunting 
uh, task of marching all the way out uh, to eastern Turkey, and he could only campaign out in these areas in June, July, and August, and then get back to the capital because there was constant plotting. So it is a real question whether, even if Romanus won this battle, uh, he would have been able to restore the empire. But in any case, it didn't happen. Uh, in August of 1071, Romanus's army, uh, just north uh, east of Lake Van today, encountered forces of the then reigning sultan, uh, Arp Arslan. Uh, there was some cavalry skirmishes. Uh, the next day, Romanus's army draws up in battle to bring the Turks uh, uh, to close order fighting. Romanus thinks that there is a second relief co column marching on to his assistance. Unfortunately, that column was not marching to his assistance. It had deserted. Uh, furthermore, Romanus's army fought all day, marching, countermarching, trying to bring the Turks to bear. Uh, the Turks skirmished with their traditional tactics, and it's a tribute that Romanus kept his forces together for so long. But towards the end of the day, Romanus decided to break camp and move back. In the uh, turn, there was some mistakes made, gaps opened up, the Turks counterattacked, the army collapsed. It was slaughtered. The emperor was captured. Uh, in the next 10 years, the Seljuk Turks began to overrun Asia Minor. Uh, once the, em the emperor is actually released uh, for a huge uh, uh, ransom uh, and is, goes back to Constantinople and is immediately deposed. Uh, but the, um, uh, the result of this victory was to open up Asia Minor to uh, the Seljuk Turks, and who began to colonize and set up capitals uh, at Sivas, at Konya, uh, at Nixar in central Turkey and set up a Muslim, Muslim state in what was the traditional heartland of the Byzantine Empire. Well, this was desperate. At the same time, the Normans are attack have taken Italy and are attacking Greece. And in the confusion, in the 10 years after the Battle of Manzikert, where this disaster took place in, in, in eastern Armenia, uh, a succession of civil wars were fought that complicated it. Uh, and in 1081, the empire situation is such that one noted historian, Stephen Runciman, who wrote a magisterial work of the Crusades and is highly recommended for the narrative of the Crusades, stated that the state of the empire in 1081 was such that only a man of great courage or great stupidity would have undertaken its government. Well, I would add they were lucky. It was a man of great intelligence. Because out of these civil wars, a fellow by the name of Alexis I, Comenus, from a leading family in Asia Minor seized power. He would beat off the Normans, he would check the Turks, he would overhaul administration and currency, and it would be he who would set out the summons to the Western Europeans. Now what he wanted were Western European mercenaries. What he got was the First Crusade. In this lecture and the following lecture, I want to sketch out the uh, Islamic world on the eve of the Crusades. Uh, both of these lectures really require us to look back uh, to a number of developments in Islam since the founding of the faith by the Prophet Muhammad. And uh, this lecture wish, in this lecture, I wish to uh, uh, outline the development of Islamic institutions from the Prophet uh, through the early Abbasid Caliphate. Uh, these are the successors of Muhammad who ruled at Baghdad. The uh, Islamic Empire in the 11th century, as well as the Chinese Empire, were probably the most successful civilizations on the Eurasian landmass. Uh, and in 1095, when the Crusaders uh, trekked, uh, were 1096, they were Crusade was called in 1095, but in 1096, when the Crusaders trekked east, many of the lands uh, through which they passed, uh, the Islamic lands, were under the authority of the Abbasid Caliph. Uh, the Abbasid Caliphate uh, to this day, uh, among most mo Muslims, is seen as a golden age, uh, and rightly so, for a variety of reasons. So in this particular lecture, I would first uh, sketch out the developments, uh, political developments, military, institutional developments, from the time of the Prophet to the founding of the Abbasid Caliphate, which centered their capital at Baghdad in Iraq. And in so doing, uh, in many ways, became heirs to the Near Eastern uh, administrative, uh, religious, and institutional traditions that stretch back to the earliest civilizations of Mesopotamia. 
Uh, then I want to look at some of the achievements of this empire, with particular stress on the diverse religious community that you had in the Abbasid Caliphate. Uh, this is an important point to stress, because I've mentioned in passing on a few occasions that when the Crusaders arrived in the Near East, large numbers of the population uh, were still Christian. There were also significant Jewish uh, communities, and, the, and in the eastern lands of Islam, uh, many were Zoroastrians or Buddhists, uh, even certain pagan uh, uh, groups, which were legitimized under the Quran, uh, were also uh, existing in large numbers. For instance, the city of Haran, ancient Karai, uh, there was a pagan group known as the Sabaeans, who somehow got themselves uh, legitimated under the Quran, a Quranic passage, and were therefore classified as people of the book, uh, Dimini, uh, Dimi, uh, who were uh, protected under Islamic law. Then the third point is to look at the political fragmentation of the Abbasid Caliphate. Uh, ironically, uh, the vision of Muhammad, which I had stressed in several earlier lectures, of a single Ummah, community of believers, uh, was fragmented by the time the Crusaders arrived. Uh, there were at least two major candidates for Caliph, successor. Uh, one, the Fatimid Caliphs in Cairo, the other, the, uh, the Abbasid Caliphs in Baghdad. And this fragmentation of the political and religious authority in the Near East in um, the time of the First Crusade was a significant factor in the success of the Crusaders. And uh, with that, uh, we'll um, uh, close this lecture uh, with uh, some thoughts on why this division took place. Now, uh, Muhammad uh, claimed to be the last of a series of prophets uh, in succession from the Hebrew prophets, the Christian prophets, uh, in the Islamic tradition, Isa, uh, that is Jesus, is regarded as the last and greatest of prophets, uh, and uh, his mother Mary is also venerated in the Islamic tradition. Uh, I do extensive work in Turkey, and even to this day, uh, there's a tradition around shrines of Mary, early Christian shrines of Mary, of Turkish Muslims tying uh, white paper or uh, cloth uh, to shrubs as a way of uh, ensuring uh, successful childbearing. It's, uh, uh, it's an ancient appeal that goes back to Christian times, carried over uh, into uh, later Muslim times. So that from the start, uh, approximately 610, when Muhammad began to have his visions, uh, Muhammad saw himself as standing uh, very much in the tradition of the Hebrew prophets. Uh, at the time, Mecca was a leading caravan center in Western Arabia. Uh, it was also uh, home to an important uh, Jewish community, and there are a number of disputes to understand exactly where Muhammad got uh, some of his notions. Uh, but uh, Muslims very quickly came to believe that his sayings, so-called surah, which were codified and eventually published in the Quran, were the direct word of God, the direct uh, manifestation of God's will. And Muhammad's uh, preachings were uh, fairly straightforward, uh, they uh, reacted to the pagan cults, uh, especially centered around the Kaaba, which was later rededicated as, as an Islamic center, uh, blood sacrifice, um, uh, various other types of, of uh, offensive rites that were, were associated with these ancient cults. Uh, and he called for a purification of belief, a return to the single God of Abraham, and the submission to God's will. That is, Islam uh, submission. A Muslim is one who submits. Uh, many uh, Christian accounts call uh, their opponents uh, Mohammedans. That's, that's really a misnomer and rather offensive to many Muslims. Uh, that implies they worship uh, Mohammed, which no Muslim would ever claim uh, they worship God. In any case, uh, Muhammad's teachings were not uh, received very uh, successfully in Mecca. Uh, he was driven out uh, in 622. He fled to the city of Medina. Uh, which is uh, to the north of uh, Mecca and a commercial rival. And uh, at Medina, uh, Muhammad uh, had been invited there, actually, by a group of merchants from Medina, uh, he and his early followers. Uh, Muhammad uh, continued to have revelations, and this is a very significant point. Uh, some of these revelations were also uh, connected with what Muslims would call uh, the Sharif, that is the law, the tradition. And from the start, Muhammad's uh, vision was not that uh, of just a prophet, but also of a statesman. Uh, forming a single community, an Ummah, the Medinans and the, uh, the Meccans who had followed uh, Muhammad, uh, eventually prevailed in a series of desultory wars, uh, and uh, uh, Mecca capitulated uh, to the prophet, 
uh, and in 630, 632, uh, Mecca was brought in, the various Arabian tribes so submitted to Muhammad and recognized him as God's prophet. Now, many of these Muslim tribes probably still retain traditional religious practices. We're not sure what all of these uh, submissions meant. Uh, but the significant fact is that for the first time in Arabian history, uh, there was a community that transcended uh, the typical boundaries of just blood and kin. Uh, from Muhammad's teaching, a series of successors, since Muhammad left no sons, uh, known as the uh, Rashidun or rightly guided caliphs, uh, directed the expansion of the Islamic Empire. Uh, the expansion was nothing uh, short of uh, spectacular. Uh, within about two and a half to three generations, uh, the first three caliphs of uh, Muhammad, uh, that is Abu Bakr, Umar, and Uthman, conquered a world empire stretching from the Atlantic to the Indus. Uh, and in the fourth generation, uh, is, uh, governors of the Islamic Empire uh, pushed into Spain, uh, pushed into Central Asia, and conquered the Indus Valley, uh, that is the former heartland of uh, Hindu civilization. Uh, from the start, Islam was associated with uh, jihad, uh, that is religious war, it's in the traditions. Uh, there was a distinct division uh, between uh, Dar al-Islam, that is the house of the believers, the house of Islam, those who submitted to the will of God, and Dar al-Harib, that is the, uh, the, uh, the house or the abode of war, that is the land of the unbelievers, where it was justified to advance Islam at the expense of the unbelievers. Uh, that's an important point to stress. Furthermore, these early conquests uh, confirmed, at least to the uh, leadership in Medina and Mecca, uh, that uh, God did favor uh, the Islamic faith. And by the 11th century, at the time of the Crusade, there was very little doubt that Islam as a world religion had impressive credentials to it. Uh, the military victories of the 7th and 8th century alone uh, catapulted this religion uh, to uh, world uh, preeminence. Now, what happened uh, in the Islamic world is this succession crisis complicated uh, the situation uh, quite quickly. There were a series of elections for the first three caliphs, and in all of those uh, elections, uh, the prime candidate uh, was a man named Ali, who was the cousin of Muhammad and whose uh, father had actually reared Muhammad. Ali was also married to Muhammad's only child, his daughter Fatima. Uh, they had two sons, Hassan and Hussein. And furthermore, he was seen as the logical successor, at least by some. Uh, the problem was that Ali wasn't very popular with the original uh, leadership of the uh, Muslims. And after being passed over on, uh, on two occasions, uh, uh, much to his resentment, in 657, uh, there was a rebellion of the Arab army in Egypt, which marched on Medina which was at that point the capital of the empire, and murdered the then reigning caliph, a fellow by the name of Uthman. Uh, and the story is he was reading the Quran, which is remarkable because we're not sure if there was a Quran in existence as a single book at the time, uh, but he was, he was uh, murdered and uh, the army offered uh, the position to Ali. Ali accepted and he was immediately opposed by the governor in Syria, a relative of Uthman, a man named Muawiyah, uh, who came from the family of the Umayyad, uh, uh, a vast clan uh, that monopolized many of the chief offices of state in the emerging Islamic empire. This first civil war, which raged for several years, uh, was uh, ended in uh, 661 uh, when extremists killed uh, Ali. Uh, Karijites, as they're known, that is those who go out, um, who just wanted to get rid of both uh, contenders. And as a result, Muawiyah was left and he was proclaimed caliph and proceeded to establish a dynastic empire, a dynastic state uh, centered on Damascus. And this is the first succession of hereditary caliphs uh, centered at Damascus from uh, 661 uh, until the end of the dynasty in about 750. This did not mean that Ali's successors, uh, Ali's uh, um, followers gave up, far from it. From the very inception of Islam, there was always alternate rulers to the existing religious authority. Uh, these included people who, could, who would later be classified as Shiites, Shia, members of the party, that is the partisans of Ali, who increasingly came to see the world in apoc apocalyptic terms, uh, that the overthrow of the existing regime uh, would bring on a, a new era of purity for Islam. 
Uh, and this feature of Islam has reappeared, reappeared repeatedly uh, throughout Muslim history. Uh, the other uh, group were known as Aliyads. Uh, their uh, objectives were often quite simple. They wanted to replace the existing regime with someone descended from Ali and Fatima. Uh, and in some occasions, you get Shiite and Aliyad uh, partisans united. In other cases, they're operating separately. But from the start, the first caliphate faced this opposition. Now, the Humayyad caliphs are not extremely well, no uh, not extremely well remembered in the Islamic tradition. And yet they built uh, the first Islamic state. Uh, they uh, created the Arabic administration. Uh, Abd al-Malik uh, was the uh, caliph to do so. Uh, they were also responsible for the assimilation of both the classical, uh, the Sassanid Persian traditions uh, into an emerging uh, Islamic uh, culture. Uh, but they were not perceived as pious. They were unpopular among the various dissidents. Uh, and furthermore, uh, the, Umay the Umayyad uh, caliphs were, were seen as particularly favorable to Arabs. And even within the Arab group, particularly favorable to the Mudar or the northern Arabs, as opposed to the Yaman, the southern Arabs, who were uh, very important as military regiments. They were also seen as not particularly favorable to the Mawali, that is the non uh, Arab converts to Islam who increased over the first three generations of the Islamic empire. And uh, Finally, the uh, uh, attempts to conquer Constantinople uh, by uh, um, uh, Umayyad armies in uh, 674, 678, and then again in 717, 718, uh, were just a series, were, were important, uh, uh, along with a series of other defeats, in compromising the position of this regime. The result was it was overthrown. And the, the uh, succeeding dynasty were the Abbasids. In a great revolution in 749 to 750, uh, the Eastern Army, uh, this is the army stationed on the frontiers of Central Asia, uh, uh, raised the uh, black flags uh, uh, in the uh, important city of Merv in 749, and the various uh, armies, uh, frontier armies, uh, proclaimed uh, the uh, authority of, the, of a possible Aliyid pretender and swept across the empire uh, and they were headed up by a fellow uh, later to take the name of Asafra, that is the bloodthirsty, uh, who claimed to be descended from Abbas, the uncle of Muhammad. And uh, this army uh, crushed uh, the, Humay uh, the Umayyad army uh, and occupied uh, Damascus and uh, took over. The Umayyad princes were actually uh, invited to a dinner party and clubbed to death in the face of the victorious Asafra. Uh, and then a, uh, rugs were thrown over them and Asafra and his generals dined uh, on those rugs while the poor groaning uh, Omayyad princes uh, bled to death. Uh, hence his name, the Bloodthirsty. Well, this transfer of power resulted in an important shift in, uh, in the axis of Islamic civilization. Uh, Asafra and his successors uh, increasingly drew upon the administrative talent, the intellectual talent, and the resources of Iran and Eastern Islam, uh, including uh, the fabled cities of Central Asia, who were linked uh, across the Tehran Basin to China, that is the important Silk Road, uh, as well as the commercial elites who were uh, linked to India uh, along the Red Sea and the uh, Persian Gulf trade. Uh, uh, to this end, there was uh, uh, the establishment by the second uh, Abbasid uh, uh, caliph, uh, al-Mansur, uh, a new capital at Baghdad uh, on the Tigris River, uh, an immense undertaking. It took uh, many, many years to construct. Uh, reputedly, over 100,000 men were employed every year. Uh, tremendous building uh, materials uh, brought in. Uh, much of it in mud brick and, uh, and glazed tile uh, in the tradition of Mesopotamia. Uh, but in 762, um, Baghdad was uh, commissioned, officially dedicated as the new capital. Well, that shift was important for a number of reasons. Uh, one, uh, Baghdad became, uh, and its associated cities, there was later a capital at Samarra to the north for about 50 years, but the cities of Iraq became the engines that fueled economic development in the Islamic empire. They became some of the most important centers of Islamic trade. Uh, furthermore, uh, by shifting the access from Syria to Iraq, uh, the succeeding Abbasid caliphs also came to depend far more on their Persian subjects. 
Uh, many of the uh, Mawali, that is the non-Arab converts, came from Persia. Uh, they increasingly staffed the administrative posts, and they also brought in uh, various Persian uh, intellectual traditions, ceremonial traditions, and uh, as a result, uh, the Abbasid court and the Abbasid caliphate has been seen very favorably by later Muslims as sponsoring the proselytizing uh, uh, of Islam. And that gets us uh, to our uh, second point. The um, Abbasid caliphate was has been remembered fondly because it is seen as the first true Islamic empire or mulk kingdom. Uh, not only did the uh, Abbasid caliphs rest their authority on these non-Arab uh, specialists for their administration, they also came to base their military authority on uh, mercenaries and very often slave soldiers uh, recruited along the frontiers, especially Turks, but also Kurds, uh, Europeans who were bought uh, from the slave markets, uh, often people of Slavic origin, Berbers in Western Africa, uh, black Africans, all being bought and brought into uh, the slave armies of the Abbasid Caliph. And uh, why not? These men would be purchased at the age of 14 or 15, uh, trained as Muslims. They had been removed from their, um, their home situation and would prove absolutely loyal and devoted to uh, the caliph. And this would relieve the caliph, free the caliph, from worrying about the old tribal um, discontent and rivalries uh, that the Umayyad caliphs faced in dealing with their Arab regiments. In addition, uh, the Abbasid caliphs promoted uh, conversion to is uh, Islam. Uh, there's an enormous amount of debate as to uh, the policy of the first uh, Islamic caliphs toward the non-Muslim populations. It was probably dictated largely by pragmatism. In the initial stages of the conquest, cities that surrendered on terms, and most of them did, uh, were simply uh, not touched. Uh, and the, um, the Umayyad and even later the Abbasid caliphs uh, used an old technique that goes back to the old Persian Empire, the Sassanid Empire, of running these communities through their religious leaders. So different Christian sectarian groups, once they surrendered, you dealt with their leader. That could be the Armenian Catholicus, it could be uh, the Syria, Syrian Patriarch or the Coptic Patriarch in Alexandria, or it could be the leading Jewish rabbis, if it's a Jewish group that has surrendered. Uh, there was a sense that uh, the non-believers should be brought over to the true faith, uh, but there wasn't the compulsion and conversion by the sword that many often assume in early Islamic conquest. Far from it. The vast majority of the population remained uh, not Muslim uh, well into the Abbasid era. On the other hand, the Abbasids did create conditions that encouraged uh, proselytizing, or at least conversion. Uh, the construction of Baghdad and the great cities along the Tigris River were one. Uh, it became quite clear in the Abbasid era uh, that to feed those huge courts, uh, it was necessary to develop uh, very extensive long-distance trade connections. Uh, this is particularly so in the 9th and early 10th century, uh, where there's a vast output of Abbasid coinage. Uh, their coins travel across the Eurasian landmass, and this was because all sorts of commodities, uh, slaves, uh, exotic commodities, uh, building material, uh, silks from China, were all being brought into these centers. Uh, by 900, Baghdad was at least a million strong. Uh, Byzantine envoys coming to the city were stunned uh, and regarded Baghdad as even greater in size and opulence than their own city, Constantinople. And that is high praise indeed, because the Byzantines are not uh, uh, inclined uh, to, to make such a concession. Uh, and that fact alone meant uh, that uh, the Abbasid Caliphate was successful, and those engaged in trade and commerce, contracts, found it uh, increasingly to their advantage to convert to Islam. Uh, that would put them under the protection of the Quran and Islamic law. That would also give them the protection of the great authority of the Abbasid Caliph when these merchants left the frontiers of the Abbasid Empire that has traveled into Central Asia or other wild places looking for uh, these various goods. Uh, so in the terms of the merchant and civic elites uh, in cities across the Islamic Empire, there was a steady conversion um, over to uh, 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 Islam. Uh, in addition, while the Christian communities and the Jewish communities were protected, and in Eastern Islam, the Zoroastrian communities, there were decided advantages. 
uh, you were freed from a head tax. Uh, if, if you were non-Muslim, you paid a head tax for the price of your faith. Uh, various civil disabilities. Uh, no non-Muslim could ride a horse or learn the use of arms. Those so inclined uh, recruited themselves into Muslim armies, eventually converted. Uh, now, that doesn't mean that there was a vast exodus of uh, Christians and Jews into uh, the new faith of Islam. But there was a steady process of conversion that took place across uh, the Islamic world from the 9th through the 11th century. And this process was still in progress when the Crusaders showed up. Now, the Abbasids, uh, in many ways, immensely successful, uh, also proved to um, uh, uh, fail to establish uh, a, a successful regime. Uh, and the Abbasid uh, dynasty didn't so much fall as their empire began to fragment uh, in the ninth century. Ironically, it fragmented at a time where, um, in many ways, the cultural and economic achievements had reached a new high order. Uh, there are several reasons for this, not the least going back to that initial split in Islam that pitted Sunni, that is the Orthodox, the ones who followed the right way, those are the followers of Muawiyah, the Abbasids who went with this line of caliphs, and the Shiite or, and the Aliyids, those who felt that somewhere along the line the leadership in Islam went wrong, that Ali was supposed to be the proper successor, and that Ali's descendants should be treated as the Imams, that is the teachers, or in Persian, the Mahdi, uh, who would uh, lead Islam uh, in a pure and rightly guided way. Uh, the Abbasids had started their revolution against the Umayy uh, Umayyad uh, caliphs under the banner of the Shiite and Aliyid sectarians. But once they took power, they had jettisoned that group uh, and, and had liquidated them just as ruthlessly as they had liquidated the Umayyad and took power in their own name. So these groups continued uh, to remain in opposition. And if anything, they flourished. The development of uh, cities and trade connections allowed Shiite and Aliyad groups uh, to set up cells in cities across the Islamic world. The sectarian groups also became quite popular among non-Arab non populations, particularly in the fringes. Uh, they gained great successes in converting Berbers in Morocco uh, and various tribal groups in the Yemen. So there was always, within the Abba, uh, Abbasid Caliphate, uh, these sources of discontent. Uh, as sectarians, they also disputed among themselves exactly what was the right way. Uh, there was a significant split in this uh, Shiite group uh, that occurred in six, uh, 765 uh, when uh, uh, the uh, sixth descendant from Hussein, who was uh, one of the sons of Ali, the second son of Ali, and was regarded as the next successor after Ali, that... Uh, with uh, his, his name was Jafar, that he had two sons, uh, one of them Ishmael uh, and another one Musa, and uh, he's, the Ishmaelites are known as the Seveners and the Musa is the Twelvers, that is, there is a split on within the Shiites of which group you wish to follow. Uh, the Twelvers, for instance, are now uh, the basis for many of the Shiite groups in Iran and Iraq today. Uh, that was the group that followed Musa in his succession uh, down to 873 when the Imam disappeared and a uh, reign of hidden Imams followed, uh, the invisible Imams uh, who were awaited at the end of the days at the Great Apocalypse. Um, Ishmael's followers, on the other hand, uh, believed that um, he was the rightful successor, and they organized themselves into a variety of groups. The most famous of them are known as the Nazarites, or more popularly known as the Assassins, who uh, emerged in the 11th century and uh, were extremely good in infiltrating and killing Sunni uh, magistrates and rulers that they found offensive. Uh, they had a major fortress at Alamut, uh, in the Elburz Mountains just south of the Caspian and were notorious for hitting, uh, sending out hit squads uh, against any um, uh, Sunni ruler uh, they found offensive. They actually were very good at doing crusaders too. Um, I think it was in 1152 where two, two assassins disguised as monks uh, killed Count Raymond II at high mass. Very, very good deal. Well, uh, finally, uh, one of the most remarkable of these uh, distant groups were the Fatimids, uh, whom I've mentioned before. 
Uh, the Fatimids uh, were very much within this line of tradition of Shiites and Aliyids. Uh, they uh, traced their descent back to Ali and Fatima, hence the name Fatimid. They were descended from Ali and the one and only daughter of Muhammad. And in 909, uh, the leader al-Mahdi, which is simply means the inspired one, came out of hiding in Morocco, rallied various Berber forces, and swept across North Africa. Uh, this um, Fatimid success uh, climaxed in 969 uh, when their uh, uh, ex-Greek or Byzantine slave general, a fellow named uh, Jawar, uh, occupied Cairo and took over Egypt. With Egypt fell Mecca and Medina, the holy cities, and uh, Fatimid armies then pushed into Syria uh, and had on, uh, as their target, Baghdad, and for a very brief moment, at one point, the Fatimid armies actually did occupy Baghdad for 40 days. Uh, this uh, stunning success meant that the Sunni uh, Abbasid caliphs in Baghdad for the first time faced a really serious Shiite um, uh, opponent. The, uh, the Eastern sectarians hailed the Fatimids uh, as their deliverance, uh, particularly the, um, uh, the assassins groups. They simply lined up. There were other sectarian groups uh, who operated technically in the name of the reigning Fatimid caliph uh, through the 10th and early 11th century, uh, expecting that these caliphs would usher in a new apocalyptic age of pure Islam. Well, unfortunately, their expectations uh, were not met. Uh, while uh, al-Muiz, um, al who was the caliph who moved the government to Cairo in, in 973, officially the Fatimids assumed a position in Cairo, uh, this government very quickly uh, settled into the administrative and, uh, and political traditions of the Near East. Uh, by the early 11th century, certainly by the reign of the notorious uh, uh, caliph al-Hakam, who uh, signed that treaty with Basel II, uh, the Fatimid caliphs were ruling essentially as uh, the Shiite version of the Abbasid caliphs. Both regimes had uh, caliphs as figureheads. Both regimes had powerful uh, ministers, viziers, uh, military officials. In the case of the Abbasids, these would be Turkish officers. In the case of the uh, Fatimid Caliph, uh, these were often Greek, Slavic, or Berber officers, that is, slave soldiers, who ran the governments. And uh, this, of course, disenchanted the uh, more extreme sectarians. And in a way, by the mid-11th century, uh, the Islamic world was now in a political and religious stalemate. Uh, the ideal of a single authority, a single ummah, uh, in the hands of, the, of a caliph, a descendant from Muhammad, uh, had been shattered. Uh, there were now two such caliphs. There's actually a third one. In 929, there was a, a caliphate set up in Spain, but it was so on the periphery that most Muslims probably didn't pay attention to it. Um, and um, this stalemate would only be broken by an unexpected change, and that is by the arrival, the migration, of the Seljuk Turks of Central Asia who would sweep through the Near East, uh, restore the authority of the Abbasid Caliph, and take on the Fatimid Caliph uh, in the name of Islam. And with the Seljuk Turks came not only a rejuvenation of Islam, but also the decisive attack on the Byzantine Empire that brought down uh, the Byzantine state and ushered in the Crusades. In this lecture, I wish to uh, follow up on the development of Islam on the eve of the Crusades. Um, we're going to concentrate on the arrival of the Seljuk Turks. These are uh, a uh, people who speak an agglutinative language uh, from Central Asia, who enter the Islamic world in the 11th century. Uh, in some ways, they're quite destructive, but in the political and military sphere, they're responsible for regenerating the authority of the Abbasid Caliphate. Uh, in the last lecture, I had concluded with the Islamic world as essentially divided between, between two great uh, authorities, the uh, Fatimid Caliphate in Cairo and the Abbasid Caliphate in Baghdad. And the breaking of this political deadlock or stalemate was a result of the Seljuk Turks who entered into the Middle East and gave their loyalty to the caliphs of Bag Baghdad and restored Sunni Islam, the authority of the Abbasid caliphs, and um, 
regenerated Islamic military power. Uh, this is the first of uh, the important steppe nomads of Central Asia who swept into the Middle East during the Middle, Middle Ages and transformed society. Uh, there will be another uh, great such migration in the 13th century, that is the Mongols, who will appear later in this series, uh, and they will not be so friendly to Islam as we shall see. But in the 11th century, the Seljuk Turks arrived as recent converts. Uh, they identified with Sunni Islam, and therefore, uh, what I'd like to start with is sketching who these Seljuk Turks are, uh, why they embraced uh, Islam, uh, what made them so inclined, and then to look at the careers of the great uh, uh, Seljuk sultans. Uh, those would be um, uh, the Sultan uh, Tugrul Bey, uh, uh, his nephew Alp Arslan, and finally Malik Shah, uh, who were responsible for rejuvenating Islamic power, and then conclude with what the implications of this new Seljuk Sultanate was for not only the Byzantine world, but also for the Western Europeans, and why the arrival of the Seljuk Turks are really responsible for the launching of the Crusades. Well, let's get to the first question, and that is the matter of who are these Seljuk Turks. Uh, certainly, uh, sometime between the late 4th and the 7th centuries AD, there was, if not a demographic, certainly a linguistic change on the great Eurasian steppes uh, that stretch from uh, the Danube all the way to the boundaries of northern China. Uh, on these steppes, traditionally, there were uh, nomadic peoples, perhaps beginning in the early Iron Age, who had learned how to um, practice uh, the seasonal pastoralism associated uh, with steppe nomads. And this is a very complicated uh, pattern of using land that is following um, the seasons in order to herd your animals, horses, uh, goats, sheep, uh, and they became quite expert in exploiting the land to sustain their herds. Uh, Initially, the steppe nomads, at least in the western arm of, uh, of the, that great steppe zone, going from the Danube to, say, Central Asia, stretching across southern Russia today, uh, were uh, primarily inhabited by people who spoke Iranian dialects. But in the early Middle Ages, these people were displaced by people speaking Turkic languages, and we think the first of these were actually the Huns. So by the 11th century, uh, the whole of the uh, steppes, uh, from really uh, the lower Danube stretching across uh, southern Russia into Central Asia to the borders of the Chinese Empire that is north of Tibet to the to the very um, western fringes of the Chinese Empire were uh, linguistically uh, a related area that is there were various Turkish dialects spoken on the other hand, these people had differentiated themselves in different types of tribes and clans. Uh, Turkmen, which specifically refers to the nomadic Turkish speaker rather than a Turk, who is uh, technically a person who speaks Turkish, is not necessarily a nomad. Uh, Turkmen society uh, was based on uh, the herding of animals, the shared relationships of different kinship groups, uh, often called in Turkish the yurt, that is the basic unit of Turkish society, and I believe in modern Turkish, at least in uh, in um, in modern Turkey, that survived as a as a student's dormitory, which is a rather extended use of the term. Uh, and, uh, of course, these uh, units of the yurt were important in exploiting the grasslands and building uh, uh, the pillars of uh, early Turkish society. When the Islamic armies overran uh, the Sassanid Empire of Persia in the 7th century and reached the great rivers of the Jaxartes and Oxus, which are the two great eastern rivers that separate the Iranian world uh, from the central steppes. And they occupied the great caravan centers of Berv, Bukhara, and Samarkand. Uh, the um, Islamic armies were now uh, the heirs to a problem which Persian shahs had faced, and that is how to secure this eastern frontier. Because the people they faced across the frontier uh, were various Turkmen tribes who had settled there at least since the 4th and 5th centuries AD. Uh, now, the Turkmen warriors they encountered already had uh, perfected their methods in, in um, uh, 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 nomadic warfare in light cavalry tactics. The um, uh, Turks always, Turkmen, always had pride in the Ghazi. Uh, the heroic warrior 
uh, often uh, armed with a uh, composite bow, uh, riding his sturdy uh, uh, horse, really uh, more of a pony than a horse. I mean, it's a rather small but very rugged animal uh, that could live on the Central Asian steppes, uh, traveling great distances. Uh, they were equipped with armor, but it was very often uh, a type of scale armor, often made out of leather rather than metal. Uh, it, um, they, uh, as they get, gained uh, more money through trade, they would equip themselves with metal armor, with the helmets and the equipment you would see in Ambassador Chinese armies. But fundamentally, their tactics were based on cavalry attacks in which they would attack their opponent uh, and uh, shower him with arrows, annoy him, draw him into an ill-conceived charge uh, where eventually uh, the attacking force would break up because the Turks on their very uh, swift horses would simply retreat and wear down their opponent, reappear and attack on uh, this sort of desultory fighting that eventually uh, the, uh, the, uh, psych the psychological morale of the opponent would break and the Turks would then move in and, and mop up. Uh, they were superb horsemen, they were ex excellent bowmen, uh, and in close hand-to-hand -hand fighting, uh, very impressive with scimitar and mace. And therefore, they were always appreciated as warriors by the settled societies. Uh, the Persian shahs had used them, uh, that is the Zoroastrian shahs of the Persian Empire. The early Islamic uh, caliphs came to the same conclusion. Uh, Turkish warriors were some of the finest men you could hire. And many of the eastern armies of Islam uh, had large uh, regiments of Turkish uh, soldiers. Now, sometimes these fellows were recruited as tribal regiments. Uh, but very frequently, starting in the 9th and 10th century, uh, they were also purchased as slaves. Uh, this was because there was endemic fighting among the um, uh, various Turkmen tribes of Central Asia. And the uh, victims were usually the defeated in such wars, and they were simply sold off. Uh, and young men were prized, they were brought in, uh, purchased at certain slave markets in Central Asia. These Turks were then removed into Baghdad. Uh, there was actually a very powerful Turkish bodyguard in the Abbasid Caliphate, uh, which tended to do such things as riot, kill caliphs, and, and dominate politics. But uh, the military power of the Turks was already long recognized before the Seljuk Turks actually arrived in the Middle East in force. In addition, uh, the uh, Turks of uh, Central Asia uh, found Islam very congenial. Now, obviously, many of them may have picked it up as they entered into military service. But there was extensive trade uh, that connected these cities of uh, northeastern Iran and the cities of Central Asia uh, with the Chinese Empire, uh, stretching across this great Tarim Basin, uh, which is the link, which means the caravans usually skirted uh, the western and northern edges of Tibet, they steered clear of Tibet, and entered into China to get silks and various other goods and bring them back uh, in the other direction. And these trade routes needed protection. Uh, Turkmen tribes hired themselves out uh, to defend caravans or extorted blackmail. It was often more a matter of degree whether you were hired or hiring them or paying blackmail. Uh, and uh, as a result, they acquired um, Islam through contact with merchants. As I mentioned in the previous lecture, uh, by the 9th and 10th centuries, many of the merchants had converted to Islam. It was to their advantage in the Abbasid Caliphate. So the Turks saw these merchants as the agents of higher civilization, as coming from the Abbasid Caliph. They also found in the teachings of Islam elements that corresponded with their own beliefs. Uh, most of them seem to have been devoted to their ancestors and had what is often called uh, by anthropologists a shamanist religion that is believing in the spirits of the ancestors with shamans who um, could uh, be in communication with the other world, uh, often induced by the use of um, uh, mind-altering substances such as hashish and the like. And uh, that meant that the... Um, uh, the Dashamid, that is the Turkish holy man or spiritual man, could easily be linked to the Islamic Imam or Mahdi, uh, that is men who had visions uh, of the other world, and uh, this made Islam in its, in its folk form very congenial to many of the Turks. Uh, and it's often been put, uh, and this is actually based on the original sources, that uh, the Central Asian uh, steppe nomads, on the whole, 
uh, were probably destined to convert to Islam uh, because of these uh, religious traditions. And it essentially runs along um, a line of whether you go Christian or whether you go Muslim, and that line is uh, the hashish vodka line. Uh, if you lived in the forest zones of Russia, uh, you were probably going to embrace Orthodox Christianity that allowed for the drinking of vodka. And we're told that in the Russian Primary Chronicle it was one of the great attractions of Christianity to the early Russian. But if you were steppe nomad types, uh, Turkish speakers along the steppes, uh, then Islam was more congenial since vodka wasn't so important to you. You didn't have to get through the Russian winters. And uh, the traditions of your holy man uh, were easily incorporated into the Islamic traditions and you tended to incline to Islam. Now it's not 100%. We have one group of Turkish speakers, the Khazars, in the 9th century uh, baffling everyone by converting to Judaism. Uh, but in any case, uh, on the whole, these lines more or less hold in Central Asia. And by the 11th century, uh, many of the Turkish tribes, at least nominally, had embraced some form of Sunni Islam, uh, the Islam that had emanated out of Baghdad. The um, result is that uh, by the opening of the 11th century, as the Islamic world is in this uh, political deadlock, that the Turks were probably one of the most effective military powers on the fringes of the Islamic world. They had already been settled as military colonists in several sections of the Islamic world. In Khorasan, particularly, in northern Iran, there were important Turkish uh, settlements. And that settlement was uh, important uh, for a variety of reasons, because as the Turks come into contact uh, with the civilized world or the settled world, uh, not only do they pick up Islam, they also pick up various cultural institutions. Uh, that would include uh, everything from rug making to architecture. And those traditions are going to be largely Persian, Iranian. Uh, and when the Turks arrive uh, in uh, the Middle East, they are in some ways the heirs, not only the bringers not only of Sunni Islam, but they're also the bringers of an Iranian-based uh, culture in the 11th and 12th century. And that will have important implications later. All, out of these wars, uh, these constant tribal wars on the, um, on the frontiers, a remarkable figure by the name of Tugrul Bey emerged uh, in 1037. And he put together a series of tribes. He's the first of the Seljuk sultans. And Seljuk simply is a term referring to their descent from a, uh, a mythical ancestor. Uh, who um, defeated rivals and consolidated these tribes into, effect, into an effective army. Uh, by 1040, he had defeated uh, several important rivals, uh, most notably uh, the Ghaznavid uh, armies. This was the leading emir, that is, uh, local authority in, in um, eastern Iran that more or less represented the Abbasid Caliphate. Uh, the Seljuk Turks were also very good in driving off Turkish tribes that were either not converted or only partially converted to Islam and securing the caravan routes. And so they won a lot of good points uh, with the caravan centers such as Merv and Samarkand uh, in ensuring the uh, flow of trade and prosperity. From that position, uh, they moved into Iran and steadily captured Iranian cities and overthrew uh, opposing regimes. Uh, the most uh, uh, curious of the regimes uh, were a group of emirs, uh, known, and emir is, uh, is the Arab word for a governor, someone operating as a subordinate to the caliph in Baghdad. Uh, the most curious of these were the so-called Buyid emirs, who ruled in western Iran, and apparently were inclined towards Shiite uh, uh, traditions, and yet had acted as sort of the indirect guardians of the Abbasid Caliph. It was a very strange uh, a political arrangement uh, in the late 10th century that characterized the fragmentation of the Abbasid Caliphate. Well, these fellows were swept away. Uh, and in 1055, Tugrul Bey entered the city of Baghdad after extinguishing all these opponents in Iran and Iraq and uh, restored the authority of the then reigning Caliph, a fellow named al Kamin, who was essentially a figurehead and was married to the daughter of Tugrul Bey. Uh, the Abbasid Caliph then invested Tugrul Bey uh, with documents and authority that made him Sultan, which was a Turkish term that meant guardian. And, and this, is a, this is an important shift in Islam. The Caliph still was the religious and political authority of Sunni Islam and was descended from Abbas, the uncle of, of, of the Prophet, according to what the Abbasids claimed. However, uh, he now entrusted to his Turkish general uh, the military power uh, to wage war. 
And what will happen over the course of the 11th and 12th century uh, is that various Turkish commanders, and dynasts, under terms such as emir or sultan, will carve out states uh, with their tribal army of, of Turks, who became the dominant military force of the Middle East, but will legitimize themselves by re, re, um, receiving uh, the commission from the Abbasid Caliph in Baghdad. And, and that, had, uh, that uh, uh, particularly was expressed in the call to prayer, uh, which occurs five times daily for Muslims, that the name of the Caliph in Baghdad would be called out rather than the Caliph in Cairo. Uh, it meant on the coinage issued uh, by uh, the Turkish commanders that the name of the Caliph in Baghdad would be named. It might also have the name of the local dynast as well. But there were a variety of official ways of recognizing the fact that uh, these tur Turkish generals, in effect, uh, operated uh, with the sanction and authority of the Abbasid Caliph. Now, Tugrul Bey uh, proved to be a uh, superb general. Furthermore, his Turkmen tribes, who had come through uh, Iran, found certain areas of the Near East quite congenial for settlement. Uh, the first of these is the grasslands known as the Al Jazeera, which still have Turkmen people living there today. Uh, and these are the grasslands of northern Iraq. Um, uh, it would be north uh, eastern Syria and actually southern Turkey today, uh, which stretch uh, across the Euphrates. Uh, there were grasslands that were easily exploited, uh, ideal for the settlement of Turkmen uh, tribes. Uh, and this area becomes a center of Turkish settlement. And through the whole era of the Crusades, many of the best Turkish soldiers that opposed the Crusades are coming from this region. Another area, as it turned out, was Central Anatolia, that is Central Asia Minor, after 1071, which is opened up to, to Turkish settlement. And so there will be areas where the Turks will settle in numbers in the Near East. Tugrul Bey, as I mentioned in, in, in two previous lectures, was primarily interested in taking on the Fatimid Caliphs, who represented the most dangerous opponent. Uh, furthermore, the Fatimids controlled Medina and Mecca, which were the holy cities of Islam. And therefore, just by the control of those cities, had some measure of legitimacy. They were also associated with all the different sectarians across uh, eastern Iran, and uh, Shiite and Aliyad, uh, that posed continual threats to the Abbasid regime. And so the, the uh, Turkmen armies moved west uh, to fight the, uh, the uh, uh, Fatimid armies. And that was always the prime objective of the sultans in Baghdad. Tugrul Bey uh, waged a war down to his death uh, in 1063. Then his nephew, Alp Arslan, when he took over, again, primarily focused his attentions on uh, the, um, uh, the Fatimid armies. Uh, and there were some important victories uh, scored uh, in capturing cities in Syria and in Palestine. However, uh, as I mentioned in a previous lecture, the uh, Turkish uh, sultans were also very conscious of the fact that the Fatimids were in alliance with the Byzantines. And they had released many of their Turkmen warriors to attack the Byzantine army, largely as a protective measure. Uh, that was to secure their flank as they moved against the Fatimids to make sure the Byzantines would not give aid to their traditional ally. Uh, they also uh, found Asia Minor very quickly, an area where they could release various Turk Turkmen tribal regiments uh, onto the Christian population and gain a lot of, uh, of, of, of uh, prestige um, in the eyes of, of the Muslims. And this requires us to uh, slow down a bit and, and see how the Muslims reacted to this uh, arrival of the Turks. They militarily and politically regenerated Baghdad. There's no doubt about it. But through the whole era of the Crusades, the Turkish military elite was unpopular in the eyes of most Muslims. They were seen as disruptive. They were seen as barbarians. They were notorious for drinking. Uh, that is alcoholic beverages, uh, such, as, such as raka. Uh, their Islam was very suspect in the eyes of many uh, uh, Muslim theologians. Furthermore, they tended to be extremely rapacious. Whenever Turkish armies were settled on, on urban populations, there were always incidents. Uh, it didn't matter uh, to most of the inhabitants of Syria and Iraq whether their livestock was taken by Fatimid armies or Turkmen armies in the name of the Abbasid Caliph. And the Turks very quickly acquired a reputation of being ferocious warriors and very hard masters. Um, and that is a point that must be stressed continually, that the Turkish military elite 
was largely, uh, I often put it, the Turks were uh, the Muslim equivalent of the Normans in some ways, although the Normans were never quite as unpopular as the Turks were in the eyes of other Muslims. But the Turks were seen as this disruptive element. So by attacking the Byzantine Empire, not only did it secure an important military position, it also allowed uh, uh, Tugrul Bey and Op Alp Arslan to send into Asia Minor against the infidel, against the Christian, uh, military regiments, tribal regiments, that otherwise would have to be quartered in Islamic cities. The result was, very quickly, they discovered that there was very little Byzantine resistance. Uh, in 1064, they captured two key Armenian cities, uh, Ani and Kars, that had only recently come under Byzantine control. And from those positions, they were able to raid across Asia Minor. Uh, this provoked uh, the Byzantine reaction that led to the disastrous battle at Manzikert in 1071. And these raids through the 1060s and 1070s revealed to the Turks very quickly that the central plateau of Asia Minor, the 50% core of that peninsula, had a um, climate and terrain very sim similar to Central Asia. And as I've noted on a number of occasions, uh, uh, it's as if a fragment of Central Asia had been thrust into the middle of a Mediterranean uh, peninsula. And in these regions, uh, the Turks migrated in large numbers while the main armies were engaged in battling the Fatimid Caliphs. Well, as a result, the 1070s and 1080s saw the success of Turkish arms. Uh, Alp Arslan died shortly after his brilliant victory uh, over Romanus IV at uh, Manzikert. Uh, he was succeeded by uh, Malik Shah in 1072 who uh, assumed the position of sultan of the uh, Grand uh, 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 Seljuk Empire, which now stretched from the shores of the Mediterranean almost to India and well into Central Asia. But with Malik Shah, we noticed an important point, uh, and that is the uh, political power of this Seljuk Empire begins to fragment. Uh, there were too many commitments, and there was also a tradition among the Seljuk Turks to parcel out power among one's descendants. And so Malik Shah, who resided in Baghdad and was primarily concerned with the eastern half of the empire, assigned authority to his brother, a fellow called Tutush, who took over the war against the Fatimids. And it is this commander who drove into Syria. Uh, it was uh, his forces that in 1086 captured the city of Antioch. And it was probably his forces who began to disrupt the pilgrimage trade of Western Europeans into Syria in the 1080s, uh, uh, which was part of the background for the Crusades. Uh, other Turkish groups who apparently operated independently of both uh, Tutish and Malik Shah migrated into Asia Minor and carved out their own states in Central Asia Minor. And these were eventually accepted as Seljuk uh, you know, powers, uh, although really uh, Malik Shah had very little authority over these fellows in Asia Minor. Uh, the most important was a, um, uh, a Turkmen Ghazi, a Ghazi warrior by the name of Suleiman, who uh, seized several important cities in Asia Minor. Uh, foremost, the city of Iconium, uh, which is renamed in Turkish as Konya, uh, where he built a Turkish state on the plateau of Asia Minor. Uh, he later captured the city of Nicaea, uh, Isnik today in Turkey, and uh, Konya is still regarded as the most sacred uh, city in Turkey. Uh, this particular state uh, saw Constantinople as its major objective. They were going to, uh, they actually called themselves the Sultans of Rum. Uh, which is a Turkish adaptation of the Arabic word Rum, which means Rome. They saw themselves, in effect, as the successors, the Muslim Turkish successors of Rome. This group, which by the 1070s had consolidated power on the Turkish plateau, began uh, on the Anatolian plateau, began to interfere with pilgrimage routes going through Asia Minor. So by the 1070s, 1080s, the whole of that land pilgrimage route, which had been set up by Basel II, uh, was very much jeopardized. There, was a, uh, there were a number of Turkish settlers in Asia Minor, but the second important uh, group uh, was a fellow by the name of uh, Malik uh, uh, Danishmend, who seized control of northeastern Turkey and styled himself as an emir, the traditional Arabic term for uh, a governor. And he seized the important modern Turkish cities of Sivas, uh, Niksar, uh, Tokat, Amazia, 
This, these are cities along a very ancient trade route, Byzantine military highway, that linked Central Asia Minor, uh, Kanya, and the more westerly uh, Sultanate of Kanya uh, with uh, the Near East. Uh, had routes leading into the Al Jazeera, it had routes leading into Iran. Uh, these, uh, this Turkish group uh, became particularly important during the period of the Crusades. Uh, they uh, were the route through which Turkish armies could move from attacks on the Byzantine Empire into Syria and vice versa. And both these states were firmly established uh, by the time the Emperor Alexis I came to the throne uh, in 1081. And both areas uh, are uh, still uh, some of the most conservative areas in Turkey because this is where the original Turkish settlement was. In Syria, uh, the position of the Seljuk Turks became even more complex. Uh, Tutish died in 1095, uh, and immediately his sons divided authority. Uh, there was one son, uh, Dukwak, who uh, uh, ruled in uh, Damascus. There was another one, uh, Ridvin, who moved, uh, Ridvan, who uh, ruled in Aleppo. Uh, and the Turkish position in Syria and the Al Jazeera became as fragmented as Asia Minor. Uh, this all on the very eve of the Crusades. That numerically, these Turkish armies posed an impressive threat. But politically, they had become so divided by 1095, uh, just before the First Crusade was preached, uh, that it played to the advantage of the Crusades. And in the meanwhile, uh, the Fatimid uh, 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 caliphs in Cairo continued to hold on to many of the ports of Palestine, the Levant, and Jerusalem, so that the political situation from the Islamic viewpoint uh, had become quite fragmented. In, in the case of the Turks of Asia Minor, uh, in many ways, the uh, government in Constantinople uh, saw these Turks as uh, a mixed blessing rather than just as a foe. Uh, the Turks moved into Asia Minor as a military elite. They employed uh, apostate Christians and Persians as their, uh, their ruling uh, uh, officials. Uh, but on the other hand, the Turks in Asia Minor were fairly remote, fairly much on the fringe of the Islamic world. And while the Byzantines did need military aid from the Western Europeans to defeat these Turks and bring them back under their authority, uh, it was not without some reason that the Emperor Alexis I and his successors thought at least the Turks of Asia Minor might be assimilated into the Byzantine com Commonwealth, might be converted. After all, their Islam was very much a folk Islam. It was an attachment to Islam based on identifying traditional shamanist traditions with Islamic traditions. Uh, it was hard to reinforce these, uh, these Turks at, at this point because there was so much fighting going on in the Middle East. Uh, furthermore, the vast majority of uh, residents in Asia Minor continued to be Christians. They continued to be Greek speakers or in southeastern Turkey, they were Armenians in the Great Taurus Mountains, in the southeastern uh, coastal zone known as Cilicia, uh, and also in the traditional Armenian homeland. There were large numbers of Armenian Christians who asserted their independence. So by uh, the year uh, 1096, with the uh, launching of the First Crusade, uh, the Islamic world briefly uh, promised uh, a reunification under the Seljuk Turks, now found itself uh, even more politically divided. To be sure, the Abbasid Caliphate had been militarily reju uh, rejuvenated. Uh, but those agents of rejuvenation, that is, the Seljuk Turks, had divided themselves into a series of competing dynasts. Uh, in turn, the Fatimid Caliph still held on to Egypt. In 1098, they actually reoccupied Jerusalem. So they had not only Jerusalem, but the holy cities. And as the, uh, the irony is that in this great struggle between the two Caliphates, unwittingly, the Seljuk Turks had sparked a reaction among Western Europeans that would launch the Great Crusades.